Hashem Hashem Naseh Menatzliach. Shil Torah. Very good to be here. Very good to see you guys. You guys have Baruch Hashem a lot of schuyot um, for coming to these lectures, for supporting them by attending. Uh, some people that are able to donate, some people that are able to uh, spread them out, share them. Uh, just tell you that the amount of stories that I get every day, um, every week, Baruch Hashem, from people that are doing tshuva is mamash unbelievable. And uh, this, everybody that shows up to the lecture, you're a partner in it. You know, whether it's because you donated one dollar or because you never donated a penny, but you still attended. You became part of the lecture and there was, you know, Hashem gave me a certain word to say only because of you. You know, you had to hear it, so he gave me the words to say, and I said to you, this is how Kiruv works. When the words come out of the heart, they reach the heart. So, Bezad Hashem, I'll tell you a couple of the stories today. Also, go over some other things in the Mishnah. We're up to number 92 in the series, Musar Prekeavot series, which by far is the most successful series we've done, Baruch Hashem. Um, and uh, the series actually in, uh, in Hollywood is uh, number 12, but it's doing good. Doing good, Baruch Hashem. We had some good feedback on there. And Zot um, Hashem, we'll keep, keep going. She will be with Wash Lema for Levana Bat Sara, Ovadia Ben Levana, Sara Bat Levana, Doris Bat Jora, David Ben Esria, Sara Bat Anat, Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Elisheva Chaya Bat Sara. Dvorah Bat Mercedes, Chana Bat Miriam, and all of Am Yisrael Bezat Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Tanefesh, Refuah Taguf. So, the, uh, so, on a good end, the amount of stories, the amount of people that are doing tshuva from all corners of the world, I got a uh, very nice email from someone in Israel today, and then a few other emails from Canada. And then a few other emails from New York and different places. But much people are finding these lectures somehow. One guy sent me a lecture, uh, sent me a uh, uh, email, said, I found your CD in some cafe. It changed my life. Like, what would, what's the chances? If you think about this, what are the chances that a dollar CD is going to change somebody's life? You know, to the good. To the bad, maybe, you know, but to the good, Mamash, the guy changes his life, does tshuva, just he found a CD, looks good, you know, he doesn't know what's in it. He decides to put it in, actually. He actually has a CD player. These days, not everybody has CD players. Uh, you know, he has a CD player. And that's why I tell people also with the CDs, it's not necessarily so much about the CD. Uh, it's really more about the marketing aspect of it because... CDs are not as, uh, CD players are not as common as they used to be. Many new cars don't come with CD players. But we still print out more and more CDs uh, because, number one, for those that still have CD players uh, in their cars. Number two, everybody has a CD player in their computer, for the most part. And last but not least, it's a good marketing tool because it's big enough, it's the size of a flyer. So even if nobody, if the person doesn't have a CD player, you still give it to them. Why? Because it's going to be a good reminder for them to go on the computer and type, you know, my name or Bezat uh, our website or, uh, or one of the lectures from Wall Street to the Western Wall because it has a picture. Whereas when you make it on a USB, you can definitely fit a lot more. But the problem is, is that it's not a marketing tool. It's, uh, you, unless it's you guys, unless it's the people that already listen to me, the Baruch Hashem, which we just broke 10,000 on uh, our Facebook group. Another ten thousand on the uh, on the page. So Baruch Hashem, the, the amount of people is growing rapidly. So if I give all ten thousand a USB, good, great for them. But they're already fans. This is really the CDs and the uh, and the USBs are really more for new people. And uh, somebody just sees a uh, a small little USB, most likely is not going to put it in. There's not enough uh, area there to actually put it. So this is marketing. I know a thing or two a little bit about marketing. Uh, at some point in my life, I spent some time in business. So, uh, usually, for my, this is my opinion, nonetheless. But, still, we're actually now going to try to raise a lot of money because we have a thousand CDs left. That's it from our last order. We're out. We have to actually order our emergency CDs. I have no idea how long it's going to take. We're still working on CD number three, on the Musar series CDs. It's all cost a lot of time and a lot of money. 
so uh, for anyone that wants to contribute, Ashrechem. Anyone that doesn't, Ashrechem too. No problem. Watch it online for free. No problem. Just learn. Learn. It's good. Your money I don't need. God sends it anyway. So, the Torah tells us that the Etz Chaim, the tree of life, which meaning the Torah or the Tzaddik, in this case the Torah, is for those that hold on to it, the ones that actually are praiseworthy, the ones that benefit the most, or the ones that invest in it. Uh, you know, so again, for those who can, you should. For those who can't, no problem. Hashem will give you the, uh, the merit as if you did it anyway. That's one of the beautiful things about Hashem. Uh, one of a trillion things. There's no end to how many beautiful things there is about Him. But it's one of the things that we know, which is that if you really want to do a mitzvah, but you can't, you're considered anus, you still get the mitzvah as if you completed it perfectly. So, for example, if you have, let's say, you, have, you want to go to Minyan in the morning, and you want to go to Nets. You want to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning to go to pray Nets. And uh, unfortunately on the way, you have, uh, I don't know, you have a flat tire. So you're not going to make it to prayer on time. Hashem counts it as if you completed that mitzvah perfectly. Perfectly. Why? Because you went, you tried, but you didn't make it. But if you just press the snooze button and you oversleep, there's no mitzvah. There's actually Avera instead. Then you get a sin instead for, for, for making a joke out of it. But the, the point is that Hashem is trying to give you mitzvot. He's trying to give you a lot of good things. And for those that can, they should. And listen, it's a, uh, the people that usually do kiruv benefit the most out of kiruv. They benefit the most in a, personally. They benefit the most in their own personal tshuva, which is some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. Do you have a relevant question? I'm just going to go. Right. What is the I, button? Because I have a oh, the snooze button. The snooze button is uh, Satan. Satan made it. Satan, snooze, same as Rashi Tevot. So, 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 if to the clowns, the cynics, he will act cynically, but to the humble, he will grant favor. This is in Proverbs 3.34. The Bible says, what does it mean if to the cynics he'll act cynically? What does it mean? This is trying to explain to us how God behaves with us. How does he behave with us? Give us the basic meaning, Lesh Lakish. We don't understand this. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does all this mean? What does it mean? What does all this mean? Amaresh Laki, she gives you the basic bottom line meaning. Pay attention, please. Forget about Facebook and everything else. Abali tame putrim lo. Abali taer mesin beado. Someone who comes to make sense. They help him. Someone who comes to become purified, they also help him. Meaning, you want to go to Gan Eden? Hashem says, come, come, I'll help you out. You want to go to Gan Eden? You really want to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning? Really? You want to wake up? I'll wake you up. I'll wake up at 5. So you can study an hour before you go to... Go to uh, if you really want to wake up, I'll wake you up. You really want to do a mitzvah? I'll give you money. But if you're one of those people who says, no, no, when I get money, I'll, give the, I'll, give, I'll, I'll, I'll donate. When I get the million dollars, then I'll donate. What about the thousand you have now? What about the 500 you have now? What about now? No, no, when I get the more, I'll get. He says, Hashem says, you know what? You're not going to get the more. Just deal with what you have. Deal with what you have. Why? Because you're lying to Hashem. If you really want to do a mitzvah, Hashem says, I'll help you. I'll give you a hand. Come, I'll show you. Come, come, I'll show you. I'll take you to the mitzvah. I'll take you to the Knesset. I'll, take, I'll give you whatever you need. Just go do the mitzvah. But if you're looking to sin, I'll help you too. Meaning, you want to go to Gehenom? No problem. I'll take you there too. I'm over there. I'm over there too. This is what Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu, he told him, come. Come, come to Paro. I'm here. What do you mean here? You're talking to me. Yeah, but I'm already over there too. I'm already over there. I'm here, but I'm over there too. You want to go to Gan Eden? Hashem will help you. You want to go to Gehenom? Hashem will help you. He's here to help us. You have to choose how you want him to help us. You have to choose. 
This comes from the Baal Tshuva of all Baal Tshuva, Resh Lakish. So Rabotai Karim, we see that Hashem has certain character traits that He has, in essence, He's showing us, not that He's limited to these character traits, Chas Shalom. He's showing us in order for us to know His ways. And the Rambam in Morin Nevuchim says that why do we have these stories? Why do we have these stories in a Torah? You have a story about Yitro, you have a story about Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, you have Moshe Rabbeinu, you have this week Parashat Mishpatim, talking about thieves, slaves, all types of things. Why do we have these stories for? Why well, just tell us, the, the Torah technically is a rule book. Technically, the Torah should be Shulchan Aruch. Do this, 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 the end. That's it. Just tell us what to do, finished. What's the stories for? The Rambam HaKadosh says, the stories are for you to understand how Hashem behaves with us, based on our actions. You see how we behave with Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? Expect no different. You see how he, 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 he behaved with Moshe and Aaron and Miriam? Expect no different. You see how he behaved with David and Shlomo? Expect no different. They had tikkunim, you'll have tikkunim. They had reward, you'll have reward. They had punishment, you had punishment. They had different ups and downs, you'll have ups and downs. Don't expect anything different. Don't say no. A lot of people say, oh, you know what? I speak to a very, very precious woman. She's mamash, an amazing person. And she always prays for her children to do tshuva kala. An easy tshuva. An easy tshuva. She was, I pray for my children to do easy tshuva. And I tell her, it's not possible, easy tshuva. It's not possible. For two reasons. Two reasons. Number one, number one, in our generation today, in my opinion, and which also includes the opinion of my rabbis, Rabbi Ephraim, Rabbi Zrachi, other big rabbis that I've spoken to, I don't believe, if any at all exist, I don't believe many souls in this generation exist that can have an easy tshuva, meaning that they just wake up one day and they love Hashem and they do everything. I don't believe such a soul exists. Uh, at least not to my knowledge. I haven't met it yet. And I haven't heard about it either, even in stories. It may exist. Listen, I'm not uh, anything. But I'm just telling you, and no one that I know thinks that it exists. So for someone to do an easy tshuva, wake up one day, and they love Hashem and they want to do everything He wants, it's very difficult. But the second reason is even more difficult. The second reason why an easy tshuva is virtually impossible is because tshuva means that you are, first of all, admitting that everything that you did and believed until this point is wrong. Your life is wrong. Hello? How are you? Yes, I'm 35 years old. Great. How's everything? Your job, your wife, your kids, your school, your, your, your thoughts about the world, your purpose of life, your bank account, your, the one you have, the one you don't have, the one you're hiding from the feds, all that stuff. It's fake. Everything's fake. Not necessarily fake, literally, but figuratively speaking, meaning that the meaning of everything changes overnight once you understand that God has a hand in your life. The mashmaut, the meaning of your relationship with your spouse changes immediately. You realize that moment that your spouse is no different than your own body. That's tshuva. If you're still yelling and screaming at your spouse, or like some people tell me, what should I tell a woman that curses her husband out all the time? I tell you, you should tell her to do tshuva. Like, no, she's charidit. I said, no, she has to do tshuva first. But to be charidit, you have to do tshuva first. She goes, no, but she keeps Shabbat. I said, okay, so is a monkey. A monkey, you ever see a monkey? No, come on, tell me, guys. You ever see a monkey mechalet Shabbat? You ever see a monkey smoke cigarettes on Shabbat or go drive on Shabbat? You ever see, why? Never, so, no monkeys, why, why you say, why you say, lashon ha'at with the monkey? Monkey keeps Shabbat. Monkey's very religious, so he doesn't wear a keep a big deal, no? Trabanan. Trabanan. Even my cat keeps Shabbat. See, you can't keep Shabbat. So, be, keeping Shabbat is, it's, of course, it's, we're all kidding aside, it's the foundation of Judaism, but to say that I'm religious just because I keep Shabbat, while I'm cursing my husband out, cursing my wife out, stealing, cheating, 
lying, not working on my midah, not working, not working on my musar on a daily basis. What religious are you? What what religious are you? That's the reality. If you still don't know how to behave, you haven't become religious yet. You haven't become religious yet. The Rav Mizrahi, Sheikh Yeh, Shanim Rabim, he says these are just robots that keep Shabbat. Robots that keep Shabbat. So Rabotai, the reality is to do tshuva means you have to admit your life is wrong. Your behavior is wrong. It's not acceptable. Why? Because the first thing you have to realize when you do tshuva is that you have to start removing yourself from yourself and replacing it with everyone else. First God, then everyone else, then eventually you. Why? Everything you're doing is for that higher purpose. So mitzvot, you're not doing because you want everyone to say, hey, look at this tzaddik, what a mitzvah he's doing. Look at this, look how he's doing tefillin. Wow, what tefillin he has. You're not doing that. Why are you doing tefillin? Why are you laying tefillin? Because Hashem said so. Why keep Shabbat? Hashem said so. Tachlis, bottom line. Why keep Shabbat? Why you do tefillin? Why you eat kosher? Oh, it's healthy. No, not because it's healthy. You're doing it because Hashem said so. Then after that, it's okay, Shlom Bayit. Oh, after 900 million shiurim uh, about Shlom Bayit in the world today. Still, we have a divorce rate higher than ever. I have no idea why. Shlom Bayit shiurim, you look on the, on the internet, Shlom Bayit shiurim, probably number one. You have a million and a half shiurim about Shlom Bayit. Divorce rate is higher than ever. Why? We haven't become human beings yet. We're not working on ourselves. We always want the other guy to work. Let him work on himself. Yeah, yeah, watch the Shlom Bayit, honey. Watch the Shlom Bayit Shiu and then let me know what he said. Everyone's the other guy to watch the Shlom Bayit Shiu. She should watch it. He should watch it. Or my friend should watch it. We always have recommendations for our friends. Let them go watch it. Let my husband watch it. Let my wife watch it. Let everybody else watch What about you? You, you, work you. Oh, I'm good. Why? I do something wrong? What, are you telling me I did something wrong? You know, I, you know how much I, I cook? You know how I clean? You know how much stuck I give? You know what Sadiqah in my tefillin shines from my head. No one wants to see the wrong in themselves. Gemara Masechet Yoma, page 119. Rabotai Karim, the first thing you must do is realize that you must empathize. Meaning you have to remove yourself from yourself and replace it with someone else. Meaning you have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Rabbi Yisraeli Misalant one time saw that one of his students is trying to be a tzaddik. They had a campus, they had a dorm, and Rabbi Yisraeli Misalant, if he slept at all, was only very few hours. He'd wake up very early in the morning. Maybe about 4 o'clock in the morning, he sees that one of his students is trying to get up also to go learn before shachrit. And he's walking over the other students. You know, in those days, they didn't have like bunk beds, each one $5,000 like today. Those days they had floors. Floor was the bed. The floor was a good bed, nice, nice and comfy and hard. Sometimes it had some sand and you know juke him there a little bit. But hey, you had to sleep. You slept. It's good. The point is, Abutai, no complaints by these these tzaddiki. No complaints. You ever hear complaint? You have a book about complaints from Yeshivot for hundred years ago? Only today. Only today we have complaints. If if the room is not in a certain class, parents is not sending the kid. What about the fact that he should be Jewish? No, no, it's okay. Well. Uh, Send him to watch uh, Super Bowl. I saw a video uh, yesterday. Somebody sent the uh, video, funny video, 30 second video of uh, how uh, after the Super Bowl, the, uh, all the players were, you know, kissing the trophy. The guy was going in the middle and they were all kissing the trophy and then they put right next to it a Jew with a Sefer Torah. And how old the Jews are kissing the Sefer Torah? I said, Baruch Hashem, Shalas Goy. That's your day kissing the, the trophy. Pesel Psalim Shtuyot. We're kissing Sefer Torah Baruch Hashem from God. Baruch Shalasanigoy. When you actually, when you have to say Baruch Shalasanigoy, you have to have Kavanah. What's the Kavanah? All these people making $20 million a year for kissing a statue. Shtuyot. At the very least, it's Shtuyot. Now, Rabotai, when you, when you realize that you have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you realize, Rabbi Islami Salant said, he saw his student walking over the other students, making a lot of noise. He was making a lot of noise. And after he got out of the room, thinking, 
is tzaddik. Rabbi Islam Yisraelan says to him, why are you stealing? The guy looks behind him, maybe somebody stole behind him, we're going to catch him together. Isn't it me? I stole? For the lab, no, I'm waking up to go learn, and then, why are you stealing? Okay, what do I do? He says, why are you stealing their sleep, making so much noise? Just because you want to wake up early in the morning, doesn't mean they have to suffer. Meaning you have to even be conscious about somebody else's sleep. Kalvachomer, their money, their time, their attention, their everything. If you are only thinking about yourself, you have yet to do tshuva rabotai. If every single time you do something, you only think about what you want, what you want to eat, not what she wants to eat. What you want to go, not where she wants to go. What you want to do, not where he wants to do, not what they want to do. Everything is about you. You, 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 you. You haven't done tshuva. Why? You're, you're falling in line with an animal. It offers instinct. Animals are selfish. A lion's hungry. Do you think he asked the lioness, hey, you want to go eat together? <laughs> want to go? No, come on, we'll get some, uh, some giraffe. What, you want zebra? Okay, no zebra today. Fine, let's go. Zebra. No, he doesn't ask. He's hungry, he goes, eats. If you don't ask her, what do you want? And you only care about what you want? You're no different than the line. You're no different than the line. Doing shuvah means you have to admit these things. Doing shuvah means that you have to start thinking about the other person. But more than anything else, you have to start thinking about God. Why? Everything he wants from you is good for you even if your spouse doesn't think so. So to go to the Shiot Torah at 9 at night, she wants you to stay home because she likes you. And you say, I have to go learn Torah. And she doesn't really want you to go. You have to do whatever you can to convince her to let you go study Shiot Torah. Why? It's more good for her than even for you going. This is one of the things that ladies do not understand. When they send their husbands to go learn Torah, if it's real Torah, not if it's just a bunch of guys uh, eating donuts. I see some people going to Shuret Torah, all they come for is the donuts or the Chinese food. I see it all the time. I see it in the Batei Knesset. I see it in different places. They call, they have enough food to kill, a, uh, to kill uh, enough people with heart attacks. And all they're doing, they're like, yeah, yeah, Rashi, yeah, <laughs> Rashi, yeah, yeah, Moshe, yeah. When are you going to study? Did you just come to eat? Just eat at home then. All they have is food, and the guy has tchina falling on his cheek, and the sushi is going over here and here, and this guy likes this sushi better than the other one. Where's the Torah? Where? Where's the Torah? Where's the Torah? Eat. Enjoy the food. I even bring food here sometimes for you guys. But the point is, Rabotai, is if the food is the reason you're going, it's not Torah. If the food is the reason you're going, it's not Torah. That's why I don't spoil you and bring you every week. So, sometimes, it's not a shiur Torah, it's like a feast with some, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu stories. But when a, a woman, a wife, young, old, indifferent, sends her husband to go learn Torah, she has to understand it's better than sending him to go to work. It's better than sending him to go to the supermarket. It's better than sending him to anywhere else. Why? You're sending him to get training to be a real husband. You're, train, you're sending him to get to become a tzaddik. Now, why is this good for you? Aside from benefiting in this world that your husband's going to become tzaddik and obviously a nicer person usually and more, more generous and so on and so forth. Why? Why is it so good? Because every single schut he gets, you get. Every single time he gets a mitzvah for a second of Torah that he listens, you get in your account also. The Gemara says, why do women get Gan Eden? For what? What do they do? They don't learn Torah. They learn a little bit here and there. Other than my Talmidim, nobody, learn, you know, it's, nobody learns like my Talmidim. My Talmidot, the women that learn my Torah, they learn, I wish the guys learned as much as them. Look at them. You guys have no notes. The women, Baruch Hashem, have notes. They're writing everything. You guys are Tzlanim. What happens? But Tzlanim I have over here. All the women have notes. They're writing down. The guys are like, they're, they're camping over here. 
Listen, I have to. Uh, you're not at that level. The women at that level. You're not at that level. Shem elachem aleinu. So this this is what we this is what we're up to. This is what this is what we got to. But that's why it says that Nashim are going to bring the Mashiach. Now I understand it. You just gave me a chidush. Shrecha, you gave me a chidush. The women are going to bring Mashiach. Baruch Hashem, Hashem. We have women going to bring Mashiach. Shrechem, Shrechem Israel. Now, Rabotai, you have to understand. You have to understand. All kidding aside, you have to understand. The Gemara says, why does a woman get Gan Eden if she doesn't learn Torah like the guy? Why? Like her husband. She doesn't. She's not obligated. Who gets the biggest ha? Someone's obligated or not obligated? No, you said obligated, you said not obligated. Okay, 50-50. Obligated. Good for you guys. Good judge. Both, you both meant it. Both meant it. Both sides were right. The real answer is the one that's obligated. The one that's obligated gets a much bigger schal. Why? Uh, they're both having just as much difficulty. Chazaku Baruch, but even more so, even more so than that, the one that's obligated gets the schut because he listened to God. And that is the reason why we do everything. All the mitzvot, if someone says to you, give me the entire Torah in one sentence, what can you say? Hashem said so. Beginning, middle, end. That's it. Hashem said so. Why do you do it? Hashem said so. Why is it good? Hashem said so. That's it. That's the entire Torah, Rabotai. The one that's obligated, the one that's obligated gets a bigger schah. Why? Because he said, he's doing what Hashem said. Now, obviously, someone... That's not obligated, also gets schal. But it's not as great. So the Gemara asks, why does a woman go to Gan Eden if she's not obligated to learn Torah? And Rabotai Karim, you have to understand the ones that are sending their husbands to Shure Torah understand this. Why? Because the Gemara says she gets Gan Eden for sending her husband to go learn Torah. Not to go to work, not to go to Wall Street, not to go sell cars, not to go build buildings. She doesn't get Gan Eden for buildings. She doesn't get Gan Eden for diamonds. She doesn't get Gan Eden for anything. What does she get Gan Eden for? Sending him Shul Torah. Why? If he, if he goes and learns Torah, he's going to become a human being. If he becomes a human being, they're both going to be. Their kids are going to be. Generation after generation is going to be Bezat Hashem. This Rabotai is something extremely important. That's why this parasha, Parashat Mishpatim, Starts off, These are the ordinances that you shall place before them. Rashi says, what do you mean these are the ordinances you put in front of them? Where are you going to put them? And behind them, on the side of them, where are you going to put them? He says, no. Put it in front of them, meaning tell them the whole truth up front. On the spot. No sugarcoating, no euphemisms. Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, Allah Shalom, Shutot Again Aleinu says, someone is ready to do tshuva, tell him everything. There's a big machloket in the world today. It's saying, oh, listen, you shouldn't tell him this. Maybe he's not ready. Maybe you're going to cool him off even though he's like ice right now. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's not going to want to come anymore. He never came before anyway. Maybe, you know. Rabbi Israel, Bala Musa, someone that made more people do tshuva than anyone else in his generation. Which would make him a professional, he would say. If I told you, listen, the best doctor in the world, by definition, how? He cured most people. So you should listen to him, right? His, his opinion is the most valuable. Rabbi Yisraeli Salaam says, someone's ready to do tshuva, tell him everything. Why everything? He can't do everything. doesn't matter what he can or he can't do. He's obligated to do everything. Let him choose what he's going to do. Who are you to decide for him what he can or he can't do? Who are you? What, you're a Navi? What, you're a prophet? You know he's not, you're going to be able to keep Shabbat or not? You know that he's going to be able to watch his breed or not? Who are you? How do you know he can keep it or not? No, no, keep in the breed. You tell him to, to watch his breed right now. He's, he's never going to come again. How do you know? Maybe it's easy for him. You know, I have a guy. No, I know a guy. Tzadik. How Tzadik? I told him one time, listen, you know, you got to watch your breed. He goes, no problem. I thought he was joking. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, he's like, I said, no, you have to watch your breed. He goes, no, no. He goes, it's no problem. I never had the problem. What do you mean you never had the problem? He goes, I never had the problem. I never, I never, it was never me. It was never me. It was never something that I ever did, he said. It was ne- I, I was never attracted to it. It never made it's just nothing. 
I said, this guy may be Eliyahu Navi. I don't know. What's, what's this guy? Is it Eliyahu Navi, maybe? Some people, you never know. You cannot decide for people what they can't or can't do. It's not your right. It's not your obligation. And it's not allowed. It's not allowed for you to decide what they can't or they can't do. You tell them the truth, let them decide. Treat them like adults. Don't treat them like two-year-olds. No, no, you can't have the candy. Why? Oh, it, it went hiding. What do you mean? Just tell the kid because she ate too many candies. Because you ate too many candies, you eat more, you're going to, you know, you're going to break your teeth, you're going to have this, you have to pay a million dollars in uh, dentist fees, then it hurts my pockets. Whatever you want to tell her. Bottom line is, she's not two years old. He's not two years old. Tell him the truth. Tell him the truth. All this sugar coating is not helping Am Yisrael. It's not helping. It's not helping. I watched this shiur, a very important shiur by Rav uh, Shai Tahan. Shichye. And he talked a little bit about this. And he said, he said, I haven't seen it in my own eyes, but I trust his word, obviously. He said he saw it in one of the Mishnayot. Same exact thing as what Rabbi Islam Salam says. Obligation to tell people everything on the spot. Why? You learn it from the Rambam. Where you learn it from the Rambam? Ilchot Gerim. The, the alachot, the laws of converts. Alachot of converts. They say a convert comes to you. He says, I want to convert. You tell him, listen, it's hard. Listen, they're killing us. Listen, you know, you weren't allowed, you were allowed to keep, you know, do whatever you want on Shabbat. Now, after, you have to keep Shabbat. The Rambam and then Shulchan Aruch and the Gemara follows as well. Beforehand or everything. It says, you tell him the foundation. You tell them that you tell them the truth about Shabbat. If you violate Shabbat, we kill you. You don't say, "Listen, drive to Shabbat. It's okay. Don't worry." Until you get ready. Until you're ready for it. No such thing. The Gemara says, "Masechet Shabbat." What if somebody, what if somebody converted, but he never really kept Shabbat? Like from day one, he never kept Shabbat. The Gemara asks this: what if, what if he converted, but he never actually kept Shabbat? Kamala says he never really converted. Why? If he doesn't know that he's not allowed to do certain things on Shabbat, then what did you do to tell him? You had to give him some type of foundation. You can't just tell him kosher is the only law. You have to eat a certain diet. Then he just thinks we're, we're vegans. He thinks the whole religion is about diet. You can't just tell him the whole religion is about clothes. Then he just thinks that we're, I don't know, maybe we have a uh, fashion uh, statement over here. You have to tell them the foundation of Judaism. So the Rambam says you have to tell them the foundation. And then after that, it says, you don't tell them everything, literally every single rule, but you have to give them the foundation. You have to give them the truth. You cannot lie to people and tell them, no, no, it's okay for now, and then later you have to change. No such thing. Whatever you tell them must be true 100%. So this is exactly how this parasha starts. And then later on, it starts talking about different laws, and one of them is a very, very controversial law. Which one is it? The law regarding slavery. Many people, I'd say no less than a dozen people have asked me over the years, oh, how can you believe in the Torah? It advocates slavery. I said, you ever read the Torah? I said, no, but I heard it. It says you're allowed to have slaves. Once somebody said, "Yeah, yeah, I read this thing. It said you have to, you're allowed to have the slaves." I said, Do "You read what it actually means. You read some commentary. What what the sages say. Explain it." Because no, I just read it. I'm sorry, it's not a fiction book. It's not a uh, Harry Potter or uh, Twilight. It's a uh, it's a book from God. You can't read it literally. You have to read it with commentary. So. Before we start into the Mishnah, we have to understand this very, very controversial law. In chapter 22 of the parasha, Sefer Shemot, book of Exodus, it says the following. If the thief is discovered while tunneling in, and he is stuck and he dies, and there's no blood guilt on his account. If the sun shone upon him, there is blood guilt on his account. He shall make restitution. If he has nothing, he shall be sold for his theft. 
if the theft shall be found in his possession, whether a live ox or a donkey or a sheep or a goat, he shall pay double. See, Rabotai, you have a handful of different statements explaining the whole thing. First and foremost, if somebody steals in Judaism, and he admits it, he admits it, he says, oh, Chatanu Avinu Pashanu, I'm sorry, I stole the glasses from you yesterday, I stole the car, I stole a million bucks, whatever it is, he comes and he pays, no problem. Finished. He pays the money back, no problem. If he gets caught, like he tried running away, he tried stealing, but he, you know, he didn't admit it, and he gets caught, the Torah says he shall pay double. He stole a million, he has to give two million. He stole one pair of glasses, he has to give two. He stole a car, he has to give two, and so on. Now what if he doesn't have? What if he doesn't have? If he has nothing, he shall be sold for his theft. If he has no money, we don't send them to jail, like the goyim. Because sending him to jail is not going to do anything good for him. It'll make him even a worse person. Why? Who's in jail? Tzadikim? Who's in jail? Murderers, rapists, pedophiles, and so on. It's, you know, in Judaism, we actually kill all those people. But nonetheless, the point is, yes, there is a jail, but it's limited. It's not to the same extent as, as what they have today. Today, it's like Taj Mahal. You kill people and then you go to Taj Mahal. You know, especially in Israel, they put all the terrorists in a in a in a uh, in a hotel. They call it a jail, though. These people go there on you know, like the guy, the terrorist, Imach Shimov just killed somebody in Uriel. All right, you see the video, you want to cry. The guy, poor guy, it's Sadiq. He's sitting at the bus stop. Sitting, he's just, just waiting at the bus stop. He sees a guy, looks, you know. Looks Jewish, look Arab, they all look the same, who knows? The guy crosses the street, and you see this mamash, I saw it, I want to cry. You see this? He's just crossing the street. The other guy's, you know, he's waiting at the bus stop. All of a sudden, he takes a knife and starts stabbing him. He's scared, he starts running away. The guy chases him down until he kills him. Wife, kids, everything left, the and him. Now, what's the worst part about the story? What's the worst part about the story? The worst part of the story. What's the worst part about the story? The worst part of the story is that his mom is most likely Jewish. The terrorist that thinks he's an Arab is acting like an Arab because his father's an Arab. It's most likely that his mom is Jewish. She married an Arab. Meaning that assimilation into marriage is now an outcome of terrorism. Shem Echem. The stories get worse and worse. So now if somebody, somebody stole, somebody stole Hashem Elohim, we don't send him to jail. Why? We don't want him to become a terrorist. We don't want him to learn from bigger thieves. We don't want him to learn from murderers. We don't want him to learn from people that are on death row. You know, because in Judaism, there's no such thing as, uh, you know, you send him to jail for murdering. The guy murdered, there's witnesses, we kill him. That's it. There's no, uh, we send him to jail for five years, ten years, twenty years. The civil system is completely demented, by the way, just so you know. And the reason why is because if somebody is a pedophile, or if somebody is a murderer or a rapist, if they have a very, very good lawyer, a lot of political connections, and a lot of money, they can get a jail sentence that's five, ten years. On the other hand, if somebody did insider trading, which is a victimless crime, in essence, what they did is they bought stock with knowledge from the company that other people did not have, then they can get 25 or 30 years in prison. Meaning that for making money, you can go to jail for 30 years. And for, for raping somebody, you go to jail for five years. This is why someone that electively goes to a secular court is considered a mechalev shem shamayim. It's considered chilul Hashem. That's why you're not even allowed to put a mezuzah. You're not even allowed to put a mezuzah on a, uh, on a secular court. Not in Israel, not in America. You're not allowed to even walk in there unless you have to, unless you have no choice. Unless literally they, you know, they subpoena you or something like that, or someone suing you that is not uh, uh, following the judicial system. You yourself cannot elect to go there. Unless you have permission from the Bedin that that's your only option. But if that's your, you cannot use it as your first option. So if somebody did something wrong to you, 
you have to go to the Bedin first. You have to try to invite them to the Bedin, see if they can agree to the Bedin, which in essence turns into an arbitration, and abide by those laws. And the reason why is because the secular system, the secular civil system, whether in America or in the United States, is against the Torah 99.9% of the time. And even if, even if the secular system makes a decision that would be the same decision as what you would have in the Torah, it's still considered Chilul Hashem, you're still not allowed to follow it. Why? Because they arrived at it without following the Torah, meaning they're using their own demented logic. So now, for us to send someone that made a mistake and stole money to jail to go learn from other thieves, murderers, and rapists is not going to be good for him. Why? We're destroying him. Might as well just kill the guy. So what does the Torah say? Someone that's stolen doesn't have the money, he spent it all in a casino, he spent it all on a car, he spent it all on something and then crashed it. He spent it all on something that's pretty much on Bitcoin before it went to nothing. He spent it all on all those things. What happens? We make him a slave. Why we make him a slave? He chose to be a slave. Meaning he decides, like, listen, I don't have any money to pay you. Obviously, I need to eat, I need to drink, I need to pay the money back to go back into society, to build myself back up. I'll be a slave. He elects to be a slave for seven years. Seven years. Now, this sounds like a harsh punishment, but actually, if you read the details of what it means to be a slave in Judaism, you'd understand that when the Chachamim and the Torah says that when someone buys himself a slave, they buy themselves a boss. You got yourself a, fl- a slave, you got yourself a boss. Why? Everything that you have that's good, you have to give him first. If you have one pillow, he has to have it. You have a steak and, and a burger, he has to have the steak. You get the burger. He has to have the best. If there's one bed, he gets the bed. Meaning, it's not like uh, slavery that happened in the uh, United States, you know, with, with African Americans, they tortured them, they killed them, and Shem and what they did to them. We're not talking, it's not, that's not the law. Slavery in Judaism is no different than a rehab. Slash, rehab, slash, a, a butler. Rehab, slash, butler. Why? Because the whole key is to help this guy do tshuva. The whole key is to help this guy see how a righteous Jew behaves. How he's treating them. Look, you're a slave. You stole from me. But what am I doing in return to you? He just, who is he going to be a slave for? The guy he stole from. He owes him the money. So what is he doing? Look, you stole from me, but I'm still feeding you steak. I'm still giving you a bed. You still have a roof over your head. I'm still talking to you in a nice way. I'm not hitting you. I'm not mistreating you. And if I mistreat you, there's a fine for it. There's a fine for it. You have to allow him to get married. You have to allow him to have kids and so on and so forth. You have to allow him to rehabilitate himself. It's not exactly Taj Mahal like I'm explaining it, but nonetheless, it's a, all of these things that I'm saying are true. The point being, Abu Tai, don't try it at home. But if you ever did and you were in the times of Moshe Rabbeinu, they would give you a steak. Uh, so, what if you don't want the slave? Why don't you want the slave? No, you're getting money from it because you have a free employee. <laughs> you're a free employee. He's going to do different things. He's going to do the farming for you. He's going to take... Huh? So, Rabotai, Karim, let's stay on focus. Let's stay focused. Let's stay focused. The point is to have it as a rehabilitation place where you could actually see, show him how Judaism really is, not how people think it is. I had somebody send me a message today or yesterday, and he says, you know, I've been doing since I've been doing tshuva and learning. Baruch Hashem, he's learning Gemara now. He's, uh, Shamayim Ba'aretz, from what he started a year ago when I first started talking to him, to today, Baruch Hashem. And uh, he tells me, listen, since I've been doing it, you know, I started paying attention to the people around me. And I ask people now, why aren't you religious? Or people that fell off, either people that used to be religious and not religious anymore, or people that are just not religious at all. And he says, after doing a lot of research and asking a lot of people, there's one common answer everyone has. What is it? Fake Jews. 
fake Jews is the reason why they stop being religious or they hate religion meaning this has nothing to do with the Torah it has to do with people's behavior and they think that somebody that wears a hat and a beard automatically is Moshe Rabbeinu so when they see the guy with the hat and beard in a strip club or in a casino or in a bar or doing all these things that are not appropriate they're saying oh that's Judaism no Rabbi that's not Judaism as we talked about on Sunday that's just somebody wearing a costume that's just somebody wearing a costume you can call it Chabad you can call it a breastlet you can call it different Hasidut call it whatever you want but in reality it has nothing to do with Chabad it has nothing to do with breastlet it has nothing to do with Hasidut it has nothing to do with Judaism it has to do with Yetzirah he has a Yetzirah and Yetzirah has a costume or she has a costume whatever it is Judaism has nothing to do with that costume nothing to do with a costume what it has to do with is how much Torah you learn how much Torah you follow how connected you are to Hashem Yitvarach, that's it if you learn Torah all day but you don't fall you don't keep the laws it was better off you didn't learn anything why you do even more work than the animal but the animals do more actual work for Hashem you learn but you're not doing there's no point if on the other hand you're just doing things but it's your whole Judaism is based on exterior you wear the uniform you say the words you use the lingo but you don't actually learn any Torah you probably don't keep any real mitzvot because you don't know how to keep them Judaism is based on Torah learning it and following it so he said mama she said to me he's like I, I couldn't believe it every single person had the same answer it always had to do it them seeing other people doing things that are against the Torah so I kept asking I'm like yeah but what he's doing is not in the Torah the Torah doesn't allow what he's doing the Torah doesn't allow what she's doing and most people that uh, were left dumbfounded why because in reality they know it really doesn't make sense because if that's the way you behaved and you would judge people and make your decision based on them then that means that you're actually less likely to want to be secular not religious why because there's a lot more secular people that are wicked than religious people if you look in the secular world you start looking at how they behave oh no look how he behaved he stole oh look he raped oh look he uh this, this. okay so don't be secular then don't be secular if you're gonna judge based on the uniform then judge it accordingly percentage wise percentage wise you see secular people how many of them are doing bad things versus people that look religious at least you'll see the percentage even from the fakers you'll see that obviously the secular world is much much worse so in reality it has nothing to do with Torah Torah tells you that you have rules you have regulations you have to follow them but someone that doesn't follow them that does not mean that their behavior is getting a, a sign off by God it's not allowed they're making a sin just like you're making a sin by listening to them but the point is is that when it comes to having a slave the whole point of the slave is to rehabilitate him at the same time get your money back and then eventually get him release him release him tell him to go back go on his life after seven years and so on now if he doesn't want to leave if his life is so good if his life is so good that he doesn't want to leave you there's actually a law here it says he doesn't want to leave now if this slavery was a forced slavery like people think would there be such a law if he doesn't want to leave if you told all the black people well, Shemachem, all the poor people that they enslaved 400 years ago don't listen if you don't want to leave stay why you don't want to leave just tell me leave. just say the word leave I'm out of here where are you gonna go it doesn't make a difference just out of here no one wanted to stay but in the Torah we actually have a law if he doesn't want to leave if he doesn't want to leave it's actually a, he gets punished for it he gets punished for it they make a hole in his ear why because he didn't listen to God when God says I want you to be a righteous Jew that fulfills all of my laws you only want to be a slave and have limited amount of laws because as a slave your 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 amount of the amount of Torah that you can learn is much less the amount of Torah that you can fulfill is much less you have much less to do so instead of getting all of the reward and all of the mass all the good things you you want to limit it for that that means you didn't hear what I said in Mount Sinai so I make a hole in your ear so obviously 
when you understand the real details of slavery in the Torah, which is not parashat, parashat mishpatim, you see that things are quite different. Now, the Mishnah in Avot, chapter 5, Mishnah 8, it says the following. Now, most likely, not most likely, it's, yeah, most likely, unless there's, most likely. Um, we're not going to finish this Mishnah tonight. Um, most likely, we're going to have to break up this Mishnah to two, maybe even three parts. It's a long Mishnah, and the details are extraordinary. So, but I'll read the entire Mishnah to you guys, and then we'll go into the details, because the important part is to understand the meaning behind each one of the creations versus just reading it to you guys, because you just read it on the internet or at home if you have the Pekavot. So the meaning will take some time, because each one of these by itself probably requires a shiul, and there's ten. So we're obviously going to not cover every single detail, but nonetheless, I think we're probably going to have to Break up this Mishnah into a couple of Shurim, maybe even three. We'll see. Bezat Hashem. So it says, Asara Dvarim Nivreu Be'erev Shabbat Ben Hashmashot Ve'eluhen Pi Ha'aretz Upi Ha'be'er Pi Ha'aton Ve'akeshet Ve'haman Ve'amate Ve'ashamir Aktav Ve'amikhtav Ve'aluchot Ve'yesh Omrim אף המזיקין וקבורתו של משה ואלו של אברהם אבינו ואלו של אברהם אבינו ויש אומרים אף צבת בצבת עשויה Translation If anybody wouldn't mind to lower it from genome temperature to normal I would be appreciated So I don't melt you guys by the time I finish the English version Ten things were created on Shabbat on Shabbat Eve at twilight, meaning before Shabbat came in. Before Shabbat came in, these ten things were created. So in essence, meaning right in that short span of time, that short span of time that separates the end of Friday and the beginning of Shabbat. Because Judaism, in Judaism, the day starts at night. The day starts at night. So, that's why in Parashat Bereshit, it always says at the end of every day, Vayi erev vayi boker yom rishon. And it was evening and it was morning, first day. It was evening and it was morning, second day. Why evening and it was morning? Because evening is the beginning of the day in Judaism. So, the end of Friday is, the end of Friday is the beginning of Saturday, but that beginning of Saturday, meaning that starts, let's say, for example, if Shabbat starts, let's say, now at 6 o'clock, that's technically Shabbat. That's technically Saturday already in Judaism. So these things, these 10 things were created in that short span of time between the ending of Friday to the beginning of Shabbat. That's a short period of time. They call it twilight. Or in Hebrew, it's called Ben Hashmashot. So what, what are these things? They are the mouth of the earth. I'll explain later. The mouth of the well. The mouth of Bilam's donkey. The rainbow. The manna bread. The staff of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Shamir worm. The script the inscription, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, some say the destructive spirits, i.e. the demons or Shadim, Moshe Rabbeinu's grave, the ram of our forefather Avraham, and some say tongues, which are made with tongues. Interesting. So, first off, first off, there's a very, very big question. Before we even go into the details of what each and every single one is, just so you know, brief explanation, the mouth of the earth is referring to the mouth that swallowed Korach and Adato. 
when the ground opened up and swallowed him, and that's one of the three entrances to Gehenom that's in this world. There's three entrances, according to the Zohar Kadosh and Rashid Chochmah, and also in the Gemara, in several places, the three entrances to Gehenom. One of them is in the desert, which is this place where we're talking about. One of them is in the ocean, and one of them is in Yerushalayim. So it's saying that this specific one in the desert was created, Ben Hashmashot. Okay. We're not going to have another game on Shur right now. Don't worry. The second thing, we're talking about the mouth of the well, which is the well of Miriam. Miriam the prophet, Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron's, uh, Avinu's, Aaron's, uh, uh, Akwen's uh, sister. There was water that followed Am Yisrael for 40 years. And that water traveled with them for 40 years, wherever they went, in the schut of Miriam. The mouth of Bilam's donkey. Bilam had a donkey that spoke. Parashat Balak. And also, um, yeah, Parashat Balak is actually where you hear the story. Then the rainbow, which is, uh, we hear about it first time in uh, Parashat Noach. The manna bread that fell from the sky and fed Amisa for 40 years. The staff of Moshe Rabbeinu, which has a history of its own, that didn't start with Moshe Rabbeinu. The Shamir worm, which is the worm that had this uh, special power in essence, or special ability, to, uh, that radiation came out of it. In the book, Science Comes of Age, or it's called in other places, it's called the, uh, the Coming Revolution by Rabbi Zemir Cohen, it talks about how the Shamir wor- worm works, very, very similar to how uh, different uh, radiation systems work today. But here it was, work, it was used to, to cut the stones of the Bet HaMikdash and also the Choshen of the Kohen Gadol. And I'll explain why. It was used this and not something else. The script, which means the, the writings of the Torah, the Hebrew alphabet some say, and some say it's just uh, simply the Torah itself. The inscription, the Mahtiv, which is the instrument that Hashem Barach used to write the Torah. The Ten Commandments, the, ten, the, two, the first uh, set of tablets. Demons. That should be an interesting part. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu's grave, that no one knows where it is. The Torah says specifically that no one knows where Moshe Rabbeinu's grave until this day in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse 6. Also, the ram of Avram Avinu, which he, uh, which he slaughtered instead of Yitzchak, in Akidat Yitzchak. And some say the tongues, which are made of tongues, because tongues, which anybody knows what tongues are, I'm not explaining it, it just it looks like a, uh, I don't know, tongues. You know, like the thing you use for a grill when you make barbecue. Kind of looks like it. Not really, but kind of looks like it. Much thicker metal. Uh, just look up on Google what tongues are. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, but the, the point is, the tongues, in order to make tongues, you need tongues. So where do the first tongues come from? In order to make a chicken, you need the egg. Where does it come? Chicken or the egg first? So that's the question. So it says that maybe Hashem created the first tongue. So that's how you make the other tongues. Is a real Gemara about it? So you see, the Torah asks everything. Everything logical, illogical. Now, Rabotai, before we go into the deeper detail of everything, all these divrei kodesh, we have to start seeing what the commentators say about the overall Mishnah at all, itself. Before we go into the details, what do they say about it? That the Rashbats, the Rashbats says that you know, in many sidurim today, they have pirkei avot in the end of the sidur. Some of them have Pirkei Avot. But there's no commentary. It's just Pirkei Avot. A lot of people read it during Pesach. In uh, other times during the year, they read it on Shabbat. Different Minagim. He says that this Mishnah specifically was removed from most Siduim. This Mishnah was removed. Why was it removed? Because it created a confusion. Why did it create a confusion? Because of the question that was asked, that most people without commentary wouldn't understand. How, how, how could this possibly be? What's the question? How can this be created, all of these ten things be created, 
which obviously have something to do with specific events that will happen in the future. Moshe Rabbeinu's grave before Moshe Rabbeinu. The ram before Avraham Yavinu and Yitzhak. The, uh, the, the, the mouth of the earth before Korach made a sin bichlal. The mouth of the well before Miriam. The, the mouth of the Aton, the, 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 the uh, mouth of the, of the donkey before Bilam even uh, did anything. How could these things be created before the event and us still have free choice? Good question? That's Rambam. It's not my question. Alvaya Light, I asked such a question. What a question. You know what the good news about the Rambam is? He has an answer too. Baruch Hashem. I just have questions. Cut. Free choice. Baku Baruch. So this question by itself requires a shiur and a half, if not a series. Free choice. We'll try to, uh, to, to answer it in a very simple way, Be'ezrat Hashem, to explain to you what it actually means here. And the Rambam says that first and foremost you should know that these miraculous items, all of these things, themselves were not actually created like it literally says in the Mishnah. They were not actually created during this time. So why does the Mishnah say they were created? Was the Mishnah lying? She goes, no. Rather, the working potential for them to be woven into the tapestry of nature was created. Meaning, the technology was created, but the actual product was not. You have the patent. You created a patent. You know, if you, if you look up every one of these technologies that's worth anything, they have a patent. So the patent doesn't mean that the product actually exists. I remember when I was on Wall Street, there was a company that we researched, and uh, we saw that there was a company that... Uh, we saw actually that um, this company had a very unique technology that they had the uh, finger scanning, finger scanning, uh, fingerprint scanning soft uh, ability that you could put it on, in a, you know, without the whole giant machines that they used to have, or the black screen, all that stuff. They had very unique technology that they were able to use in something very small, in laptops and so on. And I saw during our research that Apple, the company Apple, filed for a patent. Filed for a patent that they're going to implement fingerprint technology into the iPhones into the, the home button. I put two and two together. I said, most likely Apple's going to buy this company. Why invent it on their own? So I thought, oh, we should buy this. But before we buy it, we have to see if they have anything. So we were researching the company, trying to see if they're worth anything other than this patent. Unfortunately, we didn't finish our research and Apple already bought them. I would have made a ton of, ton of money on it, but Hashem, I didn't make any money because that was more to lose. But nonetheless, Rabotai, forget the Wall Street part, just understand the point of the story. The point of the story was the point of the story was is that patents exist. Patents exist. You go with this patents, there's many, many patents. I have a friend that has a few hundred patents himself, and patents are worth a lot of money. Sometimes when companies declare bankruptcy, they don't declare chapter seven bankruptcy like I did, when you pretty much say you have absolutely nothing. What are they what are they and pretty much whatever you do have they take anyway? What do you declare? If you actually have property, declare chapter 11. Why chapter 11? It's called restructuring, meaning you're trying to sell off whatever you have to try to get some money to pay off the dead holders. And if there's something left, keep it. So the first thing that a lot of major companies do is sell off patents. They sell off thousands and thousands of patents they have because these patents are worth a fortune. They can be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And a lot of these companies, whether it's Nortel or Nokia or Microsoft, for example, bought a, a, I don't know, a few billion dollars worth of patents. I think, I think from Nokia before they actually bought the company. Point being, Abutai, is that these patents are worth a lot of money. And sometimes the company that has them is not using them. So it's not like bread where it goes bad. You could still implement some of these patents for something else. You could reuse this technology. Leavdil 
the technology that Hashem created the world with is quite different. So Hashem said, and the Rambam is explaining, that the working potential for all of these things, for all of creation, for these ten specific things, was already created specifically at this time. Everything else was created before it. Everything else was created before it. All other miracles and abilities for nature in general was created during the first six days. These ten were created ben Mashot. Follow me so far? So now that leads us to two other questions. We have we answered one question, now we have two questions. We keep going like this, by the time we're going to have a thousand questions. No, Baruch Hashem, the next question answers it. So now we have two questions. What are the two questions? First of all, why only these ten? Why? There's many other miracles that happen in, uh, in, in history. Many, many other miracles. So why only these ten miracles, these ten big things, and not everything else? And the second question is, why right before Shabbat? Why couldn't it be on Tuesday at 3 o'clock? Or Tuesday at 9, right before the shiur, because everybody comes late anyway. Why? So the answer, Rabotai, is the following. It says that all of the other things that Hashem created, all of the other things in nature, whether it's rain, which we all think is nature because we're used to it, but in reality it's a miracle. The ability that we have to see we think it's normal, it's nature. You have eyes, you should see. The fact that you have an eye is a miracle. The fact that air goes into your lungs is a miracle. The fact that every type of food that you eat turns into blood is a miracle. It doesn't matter if it's a steak or it's an ice cream or it's anything else. Some of it is going to turn into blood. Everything is a miracle. The fact that you're able to walk, see, hear, everything, touch, everything is a miracle. But all of these other things were created during the six days and they were going to be repeated. They had the uh, ability that they're repeatable. They're repeatable. Even the miracle of Kriyat Yam Suf. When Hashem split the ocean, that's not mentioned in the ten. Why is it not mentioned in the ten? Because it happened more than once. It happened another time with Yeshua Ben Nun. When Yeshua Ben Nun took Am Yisrael to, to cross the Jordan River, Right before he came to Eretz Israel, what did Hashem do? He split the ocean the same way that he split the Sea of Reeds from Moshe Rabbeinu. And then also there's one of the Chachamim in the Gemara. So there was a very high tide and he needed to go to the other side. So he split the ocean. So this happened, according to our records, no less than two other times. Meaning, it's not like these ten miracles. These ten miracles happened once. Hashem gave the working system once but this patent is only usable once. Just one time. So now, everything else, all the other miracles, all the other things that we have in creation, which God created to make, means that all creation was invested with the ability to continue to make. So now, everything that we have in nature has the ability to recreate itself. Now when it comes to a miracle, like I said with Yam Suf, but also the creation itself. For example, one of the things that is, in my opinion, one of the most amazing miracles in the world, that I know of at least, that's understated. And that's the whole aspect of how a seed works. A seed. Just a simple seed. If you see how a seed works, first of all, it goes bad. Like you take a seed, you put it into the ground, and if you follow, there's a few, few scientists that have actually recorded this and how it's, uh, it's beautiful. It goes bad. It gets ruined. And then it grows. After it gets ruined, it, gets, it starts growing. And then the seed becomes a tree. And then the tree has fruit. And the fruits, what do they have? The seed. Why? To recreate the process again. So you have the seed, turns into a tree. The tree has fruits. And the fruit has seeds, so you have more trees, and you repeat the process over and over again, and that's how this one single miracle repopulates itself throughout all of nature forever. This is why you're not allowed to destroy fruit trees, according to the Torah. Not allowed to destroy fruit trees. Not allowed to destroy fruit trees. 
You can touch the property, just don't destroy the fruit tree. In Israel, in Israel, more, more so than America. If it's in America, it's different. It's a little different. There's a few uh, uh, leniencies, but you should definitely ask a rabbi beforehand. And El Tisrael is not allowed to. We'll talk more about it later. Now, the other thing also that's extraordinarily amazing is how water works. Water. Water, you have water. We take it for granted because we have so much of it. We have 70% or 72% of the world is water. And Baruch Hashem, none of us have ever been thirsty for more than a day when we're fasting on Yom Kippur. Now, if you go back and you rewind to the story of Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi had a debate. He saw that Am Yisrael started doing idol worship. He said, okay, you want to believe these idols? Okay, fine. I promise you rain is not going to rain. You want to go pray to your idols? And he left, and he went hiding. How long? Three years. Three years, no rain, no nothing. No rain. So in the beginning, you have reserves. You have the pools, you have the this, you have the that. But eventually the sun eats everything up. After three years, he sees that everyone is this famine. People are suffering. Then he comes, he goes, okay, fine. Now we're going to test it. You bring a korban to your false gods. And I'll bring a korban to my god. And it was during Mincha. This is why, by the way, you should know, this is where we learn that Mincha is the most important prayer of the entire day. It's more important than Shachrit. Even though Shachrit is much longer, the most significant part of the prayer today, uh, every day is Mincha. So for all of us that are missing Mincha all the time, you're missing the point. So now, Eliyahu Navi says, you can't even see Zetzal, he's still alive. He became an angel. So Eliyahu Navi, Eliyahu Navi, Zachul Etov, says, you go pray to your, your, your gods, bring a koban, and I'll pray to mine. And they start bringing koban, not praying to their idols, and nothing happens, no rain, no nothing. So he tells them, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe you should say it a little louder. He starts taunting them. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe, maybe he can't hear you. Say it a little louder for him. Maybe say it a little louder. Maybe he's busy. Nothing happened. People are starving. People can't drink. Can't, you know what it is not to drink? Just imagine how you feel on Tisha B'Av. Imagine a week like this. You haven't drank. Imagine seeing your kids, Shema Achim. They haven't drank for a week. Anyone that ever had a baby, you see your kid hungry for 30 seconds. You already have kapat avonot. You're like, no, 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 you feed, feed. You start feeding them extra with three bottles. Go, go, eat, eat. Eat. Why? You can't deal with it, a kid hungry. Take three bottles. Take, take my blood too. Take my head. Whatever. Just feel, eat, eat. Imagine you can't feed your kid. Imagine. So these people couldn't feed, but they made a sin. They went to, to, to false gods. So the Yawan of is rebuking them. He's telling them, maybe your gods can't hear. Maybe they're busy. Maybe we should wait for them. And then he says, okay, let's try my God. You know what? Let's make it, let's make it interesting. He starts pouring water to make it more difficult on the Koban to make it more difficult to light the fire. Puts water on it and this and that. He says, Hashem, please, show them who you are. Boom, fire went up, the Koban... Everybody did tshuva. Now I have a question. Question is, Abutai, why did he wait three years? If he wanted to show him that Hashem can take the Koban, he could have done it up to 30 seconds. Why three years? Huh? Could look natural. Could look natural that a fire from the sky is going to come? They didn't wait for that long. Huh? They didn't wait for three years. It looks more of a miracle. No, but if the fire came from the sky. Fire came from the sky 30 seconds later or three years later, it's the same fire coming from the sky. Point. What point? He could have proved after 30 seconds. No, you said something. Okay, but they could have done tshuva after 30 seconds. Why did, they, why did he wait three years? 
חזקה, חזקה וברוכה. רבותיי, people do not do תשובה unless they're desperate. That's what Eliyahu Navi is teaching us. Unless you realize your only choice is Hashem, you will not do tshuva. When everything was good, they went to the God of money that they created and invented in their mind that they didn't care for the truth even if the truth was in front of them. Meaning, even if he showed them fire from the sky and said, listen, you enjoy your fire, we're going to go higher. That's it. We're going somewhere else. We're not going with you. Why? We have money. We have trees, we have pools, we have this, we have that. Leave us alone. We don't want to be religious. Eliyahu Navi Zachul Etov, who's going to come three days before the Mashiach, is saying to you, Rabotai, you don't do tshuva until you have no choice, until you have no water, until you have no food, until you have nothing. Why? Because we're fools. Why? Because we're Am Kshe'orif. Stubborn people. Stubborn people. You tell people the truth. Tell people the truth a million and a half times. No, do tshuva. Be modest. Wear modest clothes. Wear modest clothes. Yeah, but it's hard for me. What's so hard? Why? It's, 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 it's actually easier. It's more comfortable to be modest as a woman. Instead of wearing something that makes you look like this, like you're suffocating, you wear loose clothes. How is that harder? You don't look like you're suffocating anymore. And you're modest. You get a mitzvah for, look, for being comfortable. What's the problem? Oh, yeah, but how, what are they going to say about me? Nothing. That's the good news. What's the problem? Why do they have to say something about you? No, but, but uh, maybe, maybe, they're, 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 uh, maybe they're, there's no answers at the end. But what if they don't give me attention anymore? Good. That means that you're, you belong to your husband and not to Tzvika and Shmuli and Shimshon and everyone else from the streets. You belong to your husband. He's the only one that sees you. What's the problem? Oh, yeah, but I don't want to feel like I'm old. You're 75 already. What are you going to wait for? 95? What are you waiting for? It, listen, as a man, forget Rabbi, as a man, it doesn't look good anyway. That's the craziest part. You're not talking to 25-year-old models to tell them become modest. Them, you tell them become modest, they become modest. They like it. They make a fashion statement out of it. The hard part is the older women. You tell them, be modest. No, it's hard for me. I don't want to look like a grandmother. But you are a grandmother. <laughs> but you are. But I don't want to look like a grandmother. What do you mean? What do you want to look like? 20 years old? It's not nice. It's not appropriate. Be modest. Even when we know the truth, we still don't want to do tshuva. Why? We have a yetzara. We have a yetzara. We have a yetzara. We have a yetzara. And the only way to beat this yetzara is by becoming glued to Hashem Yitzbarach. It's the only way. Some people go to lectures for 25 years and still don't do tshuva. 25 years ago, you go to the shiurim, you still don't do tshuva. Why? You go into the wrong shiurim. As soon as the guy tells you the truth, you run out. You go to the guy who doesn't tell the truth. So Eliyahu Navi is telling us, Rabotai Yekarim, don't be fools like the generation of Eliyahu Navi. Don't wait until Hashem starves you. Don't wait until Hashem punishes you for you to do tshuva. Don't wait. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. That's what he's telling you. So now... All of these miracles were created in a way that they could repeat themselves. Water, which is how we got to the Eliyahu Navi story, if you guys still remember, is extraordinary itself. Also, water, you let it sit out, eventually the sun makes it evaporate, turns into air. But then it comes back to being water again when it comes down as rain again from clouds. So very, very similar to the process of a seed. Seed becoming a tree, then becoming a fruit that has seed, and the seed falls into the ground and it grows another tree. Same thing with water. Water is water, then it evaporates and turns into air or into, you know, a, uh, um, air, and then, uh, and, uh, and then oxygen and so on. And then you have a, uh, turn into a cloud, which eventually goes back to being water again. 
So you see that these other miracles that you call nature and that we call nature were created in a certain way where the mir- miracle part is repeatable. These ten that this Mishnah is about are not repeatable. They happen once, the end. So that answers the first question of why just these ten are mentioned here and not all the miracles, which would be a list with no end. The second question is, why was it created before Shabbat? Why was it created at a specific time? So the simple answer, the Mepharshim are saying, that the simple answer is that their creation, these specific ten things, was for a specific purpose at a specific time which is a different time from everything else and therefore they should be given their own time that's the pshat the other part the other part of what's miraculous about these is that some of these create or all of them, all ten of these creations, as the Rambam says in Moreh Nebuchim, were unfinished creations. Why didn't he finish them? He intentionally didn't finish them. Meaning he created a patent, but the actual well didn't come into effect for a couple of thousand years. The, the mouth of the Aton didn't come into effect for a couple of thousand years. The, uh, the, uh, you know, the lamb, the, um, um, lamb, not a lamb, ram, the ram of Avraham Avinu didn't come into effect for another 1950 years. Like, so it's in essence, he had the patent, but he didn't execute the patent for a while. Why? Hashem had unfinished work. Why? Shabbat came in. He wanted to teach us how important Shabbat is and that he keeps Shabbat, Rabotai. You're not allowed to create on Shabbat. Even God doesn't create on Shabbat. So when you violate Shabbat, Shemachem, not you, but other people, because you guys all tzaddikim, anyone else, anyone else that violates Shabbat and creates fire on Shabbat, creates business dealings on Shabbat, even if it's simple talk, okay, I'll buy it from you. That's Chilul Shabbat, the Oraita. Someone that creates on Shabbat, you're not even, you're not, you don't even understand how far you are from the Creator. Because even Hashem keeps Shabbat. He says, I specifically have these ten things that I specifically didn't finish. Shabbat came in. Shabbat came in, no more creations. And to give you a simple example of one of these ten, is the demons. The demons, which I know some of you guys like this topic. The demons, by the way, so you know, what is really a demon? What is this What is this destructive spirit? What is it really? Okay, it's like an angel. Okay, this still doesn't explain what it is. Tachlis. Okay, you're telling me descriptions of what they do. What is it? Okay, you're, you're giving me the, the, the symptoms. So, okay, you give me the outcome. Okay, so what a demon is, what a, what, a, what a destructive spirit is, it's a spirit that was created with no body. You and I are spirits with a body. You have a neshama, and there was a body. And Hashem put them together. Do, 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 do. Finished, here's Amos. Ta-da! <laughs> Here's your own. Here's this. What? We put it together. Hashem put it together. Napach be'apav. He put the ruach elokim into the person. He put the soul into the person. Voila. You have it. That's us. The demons, Rabotai, the demons, Shem Rechem, is just the spirit without the body. And even the spirit is not necessarily complete. It's not the same level as a human being. And it becomes a destructive spirit. Why? Because it's incomplete. When does a person create the most amount of destructive spirits? Now, every time somebody creates a sin, 
He's creating a destructive spirit. But there's one type of sin that creates an enormous amount of destructive spirits, and that is Rabotai wasting seed. When a man wastes seed, he's creating hundreds of millions of destructive spirits. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of them. Each one of those seeds is a destructive spirit that's sitting, standing right next to him, looking for an opportunity to punish him for it. Why? He says, Abba, how come you didn't give me a body? Abba, where's my body? Abba, my body. Hey, yo, what? And then Abba has a kid with a body. What does he want to do? He wants to hurt the kid now. Why? He's jealous of the kid. This is why until this day in Yerushalayim, there's a, uh, there's a law. The children are not allowed to go into the cemetery with their father. When their father dies, Hashem and Achim, they're not allowed to bring their father's tomb into the cemetery. Why? Those destructive spirits may kill them. This is mamash a law. This is not like, oh yeah, some people. No, no, mamash, not allowed. Why? It's 100% real. Also, you should know, this is the reason why when you go and have an aliyah in Bet Knesset, you have an aliyah in Bet Knesset, and they tell you, a uh, Betzalel ben, you say, Amos ben, Yaron ben, and we always say usually, the mom. Why the mom? Why, father's not good? What's wrong with the father? Why, father's not good? Father's tzaddik. What's wrong with the father? It says, if the father is still alive, there's a chashash, meaning there's a doubt, maybe he wasted seed. So he has no merits yet, until he does tshuva. We have to use the mom, because she didn't waste any seed. That's what we use the mom. That's what we use the mom. We only use the father after he passes. That's the reason. Why? Those destructive spirits, mamash, are next to us. They're next to us. Yes. Ken. Yes and no. The difference between someone that uh, wastes seed on purpose versus someone that wastes seed in a dream is the level of punishment. When it's during a, uh, when it's on purpose, then it's called mezid. Mezid meaning it's a purposeful sin. And for that, if a person dies without doing tshuva, as we talked about in our shiur and Geinom, they enter Geinom and never leave. Now, and yeah, it's one of the three worst possible sins in all of Judaism and the entire Torah. And it's very, very serious sin, and people must do tshuva. In reality, every single man must take this into their account and do tshuva for it separately from everything else. It's not a regular tshuva, which I'll talk about momentarily. Now, if it's a nocturnal emission, or what they call a wet dream, and there is a uh, sperm that uh, leaves the body during a dream because of some dream that they had, then it's not mezid, it's not a purposeful sin, but nonetheless, it's still a sin. Why? The Gemara in Masechet Avod says, watch your eyes in the morning, so sin doesn't come to you at night. What does it mean, sin doesn't come to you at night? Only reason why you have wet dreams is because you don't watch your eyes during the day. Now, sometimes, sometimes, a person does watch his eyes, but he still has it. Anyone that has done real tshuva for wasting seed, which is a very, very serious and very difficult tshuva, but nonetheless possible, the Rambam himself says it's the most difficult thing in the world to do tshuva for. Most difficult sin. Why? It's very addictive. But nonetheless, it is possible. Hashem did not create a world where you can't do tshuva. He wants you to do tshuva. And he gives you help to do tshuva, like we talked about in the beginning of the shiur. Someone that wants to do tshuva, Hashem helps him. So now, to do tshuva for this usually is a lot of ups and downs in the beginning. You know, so a person will stop and, you know, for a month or a week or a day, whatever he stops for, and then he goes back, he does it again. And then he stops again for a month and then again. And then it's, he goes a little longer the next time, it's three months and then again. Or even if he stops completely after a while, and then uh, six months he breaks. And then again he goes for a year. And then he breaks. Or perhaps he stops completely, but he still has the dreams that end up having a seminal emission. But those seminal emissions during the dream become less and less over time. 
They become less and less over time as the body itself recovers itself, as the soul recovers itself, and also as the Hashem sees that you're very serious uh, about your tshuva. He helps you more and more. But it's not an easy sin. It's not like Shabbat, for example, we just keep Shabbat and you sleep all day on Shabbat and you're fine. F- fixing your breed takes a long time and a lot of the big chachamim say that's the tikkun of the door. That's the, uh, that's the uh, main uh, thing to do tshuva for in this last generation. So when someone has a wasting seed during a, uh, a dream of some, of some type, it's still a sin they have to do tshuva for, but it's not considered mezid. It's not considered purposeful, but it's still considered a sin because it is a result of their actions. Even if it's something you saw six months ago. Even if right now you watch your eyes already for six months, you still had that dream and it still led to that. Why? It's because of something you saw six months ago or a year ago or two years ago. And until Hashem gives you the siyat rishmait to erase it, Erase all of that bad stuff from your from your neshama, pretty much. You have to have real serious tshuva. Now, the good news is is that doing tshuva for it is very much possible. It just requires a few things. First and foremost, a person needs to understand that Hashem wants you to do tshuva. How do we know? You go to the book of Ezekiel. There's obviously a bunch of different places, but you go to the book of Ezekiel. And Hashem Barach says the following, in chapter 18, verse 32, it says, It says, I don't desire the death of a dead person. Says Hashem Elohim, do tshuva, return yourselves, and you'll live. Do tshuva, and you'll live. First of all, we have the explanation of this verse. What does it mean, I don't want the death of a dead person? How does, somebody, how does a dead person die? And second of all, what does returning have to do with doing with, with living? So Rabotai Karim, the Mefarshim, say the following. It says, when Hashem says, I don't want the death of a dead person, He's telling you that when someone is sinning on a regular basis, someone is le- leading a wicked life, and is not doing the will of Hashem, in the eyes of Hashem, He's considered dead. So Reshaim, even during their, their lives, are considered dead. Even though they're living, they may be driving, they may be doing a lot of things, but in the eyes of Hashem, they're dead. Why? They have no Olam Abba. Their life is temporary. So Hashem says, I don't have an interest. I don't have a desire to make the dead person even more dead. Meaning, I don't have a desire to have this guy that's wicked now stay like this and have no Olam Abba. Let him do tshuva. And he'll live. What do you mean he'll live? He'll live forever with me. He'll have Olam Abba. This, by the way, is one of the sources. A lot of people ask, what are the sources in the Torah for Olam Abba? This is one of the many, many sources in the Torah for Olam Abba, where he says, let him do tshuva and he'll live. Let him do tshuva and he'll live. Now, how do we do tshuva? What's the, uh, what's, what's the ingredients? Now, the verse before this, explains the key ingredient to doing tshuva. The key ingredient to doing tshuva is especially for wasting seed. Now when you arrive in Shemaim and you tell them, listen, I uh, did tshuva, I kept Shabbat, kosher, tarat mishpacha, everything was good, I washed my bleed, like yes, you did all of that, but you have Shabbat missing for five years. You know, you didn't keep Shabbat for five years. Or you didn't, uh, you know, before you did tshuva. Or you didn't keep Shabbat for 20 years. Or you didn't uh, watch your breed for 20 years. So you have to make that up. So first and foremost, to do tshuva, you have to do a few things. Number one, stop sinning. Simple enough, stop. Simple to understand. Two, regret the sin. Talk to Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. Listen, I know what I did was wrong. I'm sorry. How many times? As long as you still feel pain from it. If you feel that what you did was wrong, keep saying, I'm sorry. This is what Eid Bodedut, for example, is supposed to be really about. It's not just supposed to be about asking Hashem for millions of dollars. For people that like to do Eid Bodedut, for example, Rabbi Nachman Breslev and others that talk about Eid Bodedut, in reality, it's not just about asking for stuff. Hashem is not Santa Claus. It's about doing tshuva. Chatanu avinu pashanu. If you say, I'm sorry, you're opening the gates of heaven. Why? 
you're showing Hashem that it's good for him to give you. Why? You're doing tshuva. He wants to give you more than anyone else. So doing tshuva is the second thing of saying I'm sorry. Now, how do you still, how do you make up for that lost time before tshuva? The other verse gives you the exact secret. Again, book of Ezekiel, this is chapter 18. Starts with verse 30. Neum Adonai Elohim, shuvu ve'ashivu mikol pish'echem ve'lo yelechem le'michshol avon ashlichu me'alechem et kol pish'echem asher pashatem bam ve'asu lachem lev chadash ve'ruach chadasha ve'lama tamutu bet Yisrael The word of Hashem says return and bring others back from all your transgressions so that they not be for you an obstacle of iniquity Cast off upon yourselves all the transgressions through which you have transgressed and make for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, O house of Israel? So at the end of the verse, he's telling you, I don't want you to die. Why should you just die like this, uh, you know, without doing tshuva? Do tshuva. But how do I do tshuva? You do tshuva and bring the others with you. Meaning, do kiruv. You have to do kiruv in order to do tshuva. You must. Why? He says it right here. So they are not an obstacle of iniquity for you. What does it mean they're not an obstacle of iniquity for you? A few reasons. A few things. Number one, it could be that one of your things that you did caused other people to sin. Because you are Mechalel Shabbat, you brought a few people down with you. A few other people started violating Shabbat. That's number one. If you are immodest, you cause other people to behave that way also. So you have to do it, you have to get them to do tshuva. That's number one. Number two, number two, that's how you make up for that missing ingredient. If you come up to the Shemayim with 5, 10, 20 years of missing Shabbat or missing wasting seed, you haven't watched your beat for 20 years, how do you fix it? Ezekiel the prophet tells you, get somebody else to do tshuva for wasting seed. Get somebody else to do tshuva for Shabbat. Why? Every time they keep that mitzvah, it goes to your credit also. So now every Shabbat for you is two Shabbats. Every time he watches your bre- his breath, it's like you watch your breath. If he was to do it five times a day like a machine, now it's like you watch your breath five times. Now it means that instead of having a deficit of five, ten, or twenty years that you missed out yourself because you didn't do tshuva, you show up to Shabbat with a surplus. All the extra mitzvot that you have. This is why the Chavot Alevavot, we said it on Sunday, but it's worth repeating again. The Rabbeinu Bachye, almost a thousand years ago, in Sharei Avat Hashem, Perek Vav, he says, even if somebody gets to such a high level to fix his own neshama, in front of his creator and even if he's even gone to the point where he's fixed it so well that he looks like an angel he looks like the prophet Moshe Rabbeinu in his midot atovot, in his good midot in his good behavior and how much he sacrifices himself in front of Hashem Barach, and he has this pure love for Hashem even if someone has fixed himself to that extent, he became a little mini Moshe Rabbeinu. She became a little Sarah Imenu. The Chovot Levavot says, even though his marriage will never be like someone who gets other people to come back to Hashem. Will never be like someone who makes the wicked go back and serve Hashem. Never. Not a maybe. Never. Never. You could learn Torah, you go on a kolel, Learn from morning to night and somehow invent 48 hours in a day. Chovot Levavod says, it's still, even you got to Moshe Rabbeinu, still not going to be like someone that gets people to do tshuva. Now getting people to do tshuva does not mean me. Does not mean just a speaker. It also means someone that gives a CD out. It also means that someone that gives a dollar to buy the CD. It also gets someone that arranges a lecture. You get 25, 50, 500, 1,000, 200 people show up to lecture. Somebody does tshuva, ashrecha ve'ashrecha kecha. 
You get people to do tshuva. There's nobody better than you in the world. There's nothing you can do greater than this. Now, who is this Chovot HaLevavot? Rabbi Yosef Karo, Allah Shalom, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, he had a book separate from the Shulchan Aruch called Magid Yesharim, which was his journal of the conversations between him and the Malach, which was his Chavruta. He had an angel that was his Chavruta, and the angel told him to study Musar every day. What Musar? Study Chovot Levavot. Study Chovot Levavot. By the way, anyone that hasn't watched Rav Mizrahi's series about Chovot Levavot, you're missing a little piece of Olam Abba. You should watch it. The point being is Rabotai is Chovot Levavot is not just some uh, nice book. This is foundation of Musar. Not many things are bigger than it. Pirkei Avot obviously becomes much, for, much before it, 1500 years before it, by the Tanaim. But the point being is, Rabotai, this is the foundation of all Musar. There's a few major writings in, in Musar. You have Pirkei Avot, obviously, is the foundation of all. The book of Deuteronomy, obviously, the, the fifth book of Moses. Musar is bigger than anything. You read that book, if enough times you become Moshe Rabbeinu. If you're not Moshe, you haven't read it enough times. A, uh, you have a, uh, the Chovot Levavot, you have Mesirat Yesharim, you have Ochot Sadikim, you have a, uh, uh, Rabbi Israel Misalant, you have a Or Israel. Several major, major writings that are extraordinary. Even a, uh, writings like Rashid Chochma, if you have the ability to read Hebrew clearly and understand what you're reading. A lot of great things. This is one of the best ones. To such an extent that an angel, angel, an angel from Shemaim came down and said to Rabbi Yosef Karo, read Chovot Levavot every day. One day he didn't read enough, the angel yelled at him. He writes it in the journal. He writes it in Megiddo Shemaim, he yelled at him, I got rebuked today. Imagine getting rebuked by an angel. Shem Elachem. Scary. You guys are scared of me. Imagine an angel. Angel scared. scared Tell him, you're not studying Musar enough. You only studied two hours. You only studied Musa. Rabbi Yosef Karo, they only studied two hours Musa. If you need to study two hours Musa, we need to study 2,000 years. The point is, Rabotai, is that he's saying the same thing as the prophet Ezekiel said 2,000 years before him. You want to do tshuva, you must get other people to do tshuva. You must, one way or another. If you have money, use it. If you don't, use your other talents. You have something. Hashem didn't create you as a golem. Even the golem has a talent. He was beating up the, the goyim. You have something you can do. You're on your phone 90% of the day. Share. Instead of looking at shtuyot on the internet and ducks crossing the street and the cops picking up in the middle of the highway, instead of doing that, take one to lecture, share it with your friends. Religious, not religious, don't think too much. Just share. Become a robot. I'm telling you, becoming a robot makes it much easier to do cube. Don't overthink it. You overthink it, you end up doing nothing. Why? Anytime you think, Yitzhara enters. Yitzhara enters, cube ended. To do cube is very difficult, Rabotai. Everybody on, on Team Hashem has to mamash, sacrifice their life to do cube. It's not easy because the merit for it is extraordinary. It's not easy. There's a lot of tests that come to people that do Kyiv. In the beginning, it's easy, it's nice, it's cool. Everybody's excited for the first week, maybe two weeks. After that, bodies drop. After that, no, no, I can't do it anymore. What happened? I lost my job. Why'd you lose your job? Everything's going to be okay. No, don't get another job. Oh, my father's, uh, you know, yelling at me. My mom, my wife, my this. Some problems. Why? Satan sends them problems to get them to stop doing Kyiv. Why? You're stealing my employees. You get people to do tshuva. But that's what Ezekiel is telling you. This is the word of God. He's saying you want to do tshuva, you must do it. You must do it. You have to do something. Share lectures, arrange lectures, donate money, do something. Just doing nothing and thinking that's because you, you send 50 bucks a month to somebody you don't even know if it, what he does actually works and you think that's good. It's not. You, you must know that it works. You must know that the money is actually working. It's doing something. It's not just filling up bank accounts. A lot of people are just cash machines. They just, you know, they take your cash, they do nothing with it other than buy themselves stuff. You have to make sure that there's actually something happening. 
people are actually doing tshuva. You must see results. Now, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a, um, a real life story of your schut, what you guys did, you, not me, you did by attending the shiurim. Because you attend, can you please stop praying with the phone? It's, uh, it's driving me crazy. Yeah. Let's pay attention. It's for your own neshamot, not for me. You have merits. And therefore, people do tshuva for you. I'm the tuki. I'm the little parrot. I say stuff that Hashem tells me to say, and that's it. You guys have merits. I'll tell you what merits you have. Now, one of the most difficult things in this generation to do tshuva for, for women, is kisugosh. Covering your hair. Now, we've talked about this again. I told you on Sunday we're not going to talk about it again, but then I told you we are going to talk about it. We'll talk about it. Why? Because that night... Hey, it's not my fault. That night, I got home. I got lecture, I got an email from one of my students in Canada. Ishtabach Shemol Ad, best story yet. Many people have told me that they've made the change, the tshuva, and so on. I actually, even have a keilav chabad, by the way. I can't tell you where because then there's going to be problems. A whole keilav chabadnikot. These little chabadniks, women. Everybody put kisui rosh on. Everybody took off the wig. Chabad. That's like Mashiach. You brought the Mashiach. Mama, you have a whole keila in the West Coast that the whole Chabad, all the women decide we're going to put Kisui Rosha on, no more wigs. But this story beats it. In my opinion, you guys can decide. This story beats it. Now, the whole machloke, the debate for years already of whether it's a uh, modest, not modest, we're not going to go into that. We talked about how it's the source of real hair wigs is Avodah Zarah. It's from India, it's creating Avodah Zarah. They're doing it as Abu Dazara and so on and so forth. We're not going to repeat it because we're running out of time. And we haven't even started the real part of the Mishnah. So, people keep telling me, whenever I come up with new information, they always say, yeah, but this one said this, but this one said that. Everybody always has rebuttals. Why? Because they want to continue wearing wigs. And I always said, if they fought as much for the mitzvah of Shabbat, as they do for the mitzvah of the wig, that they think is a mitzvah, Am Yisrael would keep, all of Am Yisrael would keep Shabbat, instead of only 20% of it. Most of the people that fight me are not the women, it's actually the men. Which ones? The rabbis. The rabbis fight me all the time. It's the most insane thing in the world. They don't stop texting me and emailing me and calling me nonstop. It's the most annoying thing in the world. I have to put them on block because they don't stop. But anyway, it's a very, very difficult transition. Well, if you go from nothing to a scarf on your head, it's, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. Because you just you go from nothing to something. But to go from a wig that makes you look like a model to a mitpachat that makes you look like a Jew, it's a big transition, especially when everyone else still looks like models. It's a big peer pressure, difficulty, and so on and so forth. So I said, listen, it's not a matter of modesty only. It's also a matter of Avodah Zarah. It's Ten Commandments. It's basic Judaism 101. The, the hair comes from India. It's Avodah Zarah. So now people always say, no, but maybe they didn't mean it for it to be Avodah Zarah. And one Prosek said that if they really didn't mean it, and it was really only their fathers that meant it, and it was really not them that meant it, or it was somebody else that meant it, and really the statue wasn't there, it was really in a different room, and then they didn't really give him any money for it, and all these stuyot excuses of why it's not Abu Dazara, nonsense. Point is, people keep fighting for it. I think this story, if anyone understands the story, the magnitude of the story, I think this is like a nail in the coffin. If you want to know the woman, I give you the information. Her name is Malika, she lives in Canada, Baruch Hashem. The full tshuva with this thing. What does she say? She says, she sends me a story, it's, it's like long overdue, and she says that after she realized all of the problems with the wigs, she realized we can't do this anymore. We can't keep wearing, uh, praying to Hashem with Abu Dazar on our head. It's like telling your wife you love her with your girlfriend right here. So it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. You can't have Abu Dazar on your head and tell Hashem, hey, Hashem, uh, help me out with some parnasa. Give me the fuash lima. 
give me this, give me, you can't, it's not, it's not possible. So now, Rabotai Karim, she says, we have to do tshuva, a husband, Baruch Hashem, tzaddik, agrees, she puts Kisu Roshan. Now the first night, she goes to the shul, everybody looks at her like she has six heads. <laughs> Whoa, what happened? Kisu Rosh, because there's only one other woman in the whole kila that has a scarf on her head. Everyone else has uh, Marilyn Monroe's hair. Everyone else has wigs and this and that. Everyone has. <laughs> so they're all looking. Whoa. But they were nice enough to like say, oh, oh, well, good for you. You know, they weren't like some of the other people that I have. One woman that put a uh, mitpachat on. She was a uh, mora. She was a teacher in a yeshiva. A teacher in yeshiva in London. She came to the yeshiva with the mitpachat, the principal of the school, the head rabbi of the school, came to her and says, if you don't take that off and put a wig on, I'm firing you. Head rabbi of a yeshiva. Rabbi is like this, we don't need satan, he's already doing it. So anyway, Rabotai Karim, she comes to the shul, everyone looks like she has six heads, but little by little they cool off, and then some people give even compliments, they're nice enough about it, but still, you never really know. Maybe they're going to say something bad after, maybe this, maybe that. You never really know. You need some extra fire. What did I tell you in the beginning of the shoe? What did Rosh Lakish say? Someone that comes to become purified, Hashem gives him a hand. How much of a hand? How much does he need? Custom made. She arrives home, she goes home. She has a little four-year-old cute little angel. And the little cute little angel goes into a room that no one goes into. Some room that it's used for storage in the house. It's used for storage. And he comes out with what? A J.C. Penny statue in his hand. He comes out with, why? Where's the statue coming from? She's not a Christian. Her husband's not. What happened? They were storing some stuff for an old tenant who never picked up his stuff. And they said when he picks up his stuff, eventually we'll give it to him. They didn't know. They didn't look through his stuff. It's his stuff. So they just left it in this room that they don't use anyway. Little four-year-old angel came in there. Do, 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 do. She sees she has the statue. Not only that used to be on her head. Used to be in the house. Baruch Hashem. She destroys the statue like she's obligated to do. Only mitzvah with statues are to destroy them. So Hashem showed her, Listen. Good. You had the statue on your head, but you also had it in your house. Because you removed it out of your own will from your head, I'll remove it out of your house. Million bucks or not? <laughs> Worth coming tonight just for this story, right? If you guys have the story here, I have it printed out, but it would take me longer to say it. There's actually more details to the story, but I think you get the point. And that's Asherim Yisrael. For such people, Hashem created the world. For such people, Hashem continues the world. Because it says every Yom Shishi, every Shabbat, we say, Hashem Lamabu Yashav. God sat while He destroyed the world with the flood. How come He doesn't destroy the world? People like this do tshuva. People like this do tshuva. You have to understand you come to Yeshua, you give power to the speaker, you give him something to say. Hashem gives him word to say because of you. That's also Kiruv. It's not just this, it's not just, it's not one thing. It's a million parts. It's a machine. It's a machine that works. Should be one of these miracles, one of these ten miracles, Kiruv. <laughs> so anyway, Rabotai, we have these ten miracles now that we finished the introduction. So we'll go into a couple of them. Like I said, it's going to be a couple of shiurim. And it says the following. The Pia Aretz, the Pia Aretz, mouth of the earth, was after Korach Ve'adato in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, verse 28 to 32. It talks about how Korach got 250 of the biggest rabbis in the world to join him. And do what? 
go against Moshe Rabbeinu. No pachot ve lo yoter. No more, no less. He didn't get 250 uh, mafia. He didn't get 250 gangsters. He didn't get 250 politicians. He got 250 of the biggest rabbis in the world. The heads. The top of the top. To join him. How could it be? After he goes against Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu says, let Hashem show us what the truth is. And tomorrow, he's going to answer us in a miraculous way. Moshe Rabbeinu, for the first time, and, and last time in his life, he's asking for a miracle. He's asking Hashem for a supernatural, so no one second guesses it again. Second question is why? Why is he asking for a miracle? Why don't you just say, God, kill him, and that's it, the end. God, let me kill him. You know what? Give me the knife. Stab me in this guy. Aaron, go. No. Okay, he's got 250 rabbis. You got a few million people on your back. What's the problem? So, and the next question is, what do we learn from this story and why is this even here? So first and foremost... The issue with Korach, the Gemara in Masichet Shabbat, it says, how did it get to such a point, how did it get to such a point that Korach was able to get the big Chachamim to join him? How could it be? So the Gemara says the following. This might sound a little familiar to you guys. You may have heard some stories like this. It says that Korah had a lot of money. How much money was the richest man of all time? Until this day, there's an expression in Hebrew, Ashir ke Korach, meaning as rich as Korach. It's a rise in the lecture, don't worry. A lot of interesting distractions. The Korach was very, very rich because he found one of the three treasures that Yosef at Sadiq hid. He split the wealth that he made for Egypt into three. One of them he buried, and Korach found it. The other one he buried, and all of Am Yisrael found it, meaning that Korach had as much as all of Am Yisrael. Millions and millions of people have, are sh they're all millionaires. Everyone's a millionaire, by the way. And then there's Koach. He has as much as everyone put together. If you can just imagine such a thing. They're all millionaires, and he has as much as all of them. Millions of them. So now, Koach, what do rich people do? They celebrate. They have parties. Who do you invite? Important people. Who did he invite? The rabbis. Now the rabbis, the Gemara says, they attended the party and they knew that Korach is a bald stakai. If she has money, we have to be nice to him. So we're going to give him some, some compliments to Korach. Korach, you know, pfft, he's such a nice looking. Wow, tzaddik. He's such tzaddik, Korach. You saw Talmit Chacham. Wow, your kids. Wow, what is it? Wow, wow, a lot of wows. You know what, Korach? Pfft, I think you should run for office, Korach. Korach says, that's what I've been thinking. That's what I've been thinking all along, but I need your support. And they said, you got it. Why? They want more money. Rabotai Karim, Rabotai Karim, we sold our souls for money again. Again for money, again. Again the rabbi sold their souls to the devil for money. That's why Hashem Bar says at the end of Parashat Yitro, after the Ten Commandments, he already told us several times, don't have any other gods. Don't use my name in vain. Don't have any statues. Already we have an explanation. There's three commandments that's between us and God. He still after that, he mentions again, don't replace me with the God of money. What do you mean? But you said something else. No, no, no. This is special. Why? This is Dore Dorot. This is forever. This is the generation of then, generation of now. 
people are constantly selling Hashem out. Religious and non-religious. Stop selling Hashem. He's not for sale. So the Gemara says, Korach and Adato got punished. Punished horrendously. The when the moment of truth came, the ground opened up and swallowed Korach. And until this day, the Chachamim say that there's a place in the desert that you hear Korach yelling and screaming, Hashem is a met, Moshe is a met, and Torah to a met. God is the truth, His prophet Moshe is the truth, and their Torah is the truth. Even to this day. There's a machloka, there's a debate of whether he has a share in the world to come because his story has made some people do tshuva throughout history, but it's only a machloka. Some people say to the extreme that he has no share of the world to come, and some people say that he may have a share of the world to come. Nonetheless, Korach is not exactly a good place to be. Where is it? It's, I'll give you the address after this year. You can look, Google it up. Well, Uber, Uber, Uber it. So, Rabotai Karim, the first question is why this whole thing happened. We see it was all because of money. All because of money, kavod, ruined lives, ruined generations. Next question is, next question is, anybody remember the next question? I might have an issue with myself. Well, we have that. We have answered that question. The rabbis did it because of money. Yeah. We answered it with money. What was actually predetermined? Ah, predetermined. So now the question is, should actually be, wait a minute. This mouth, this mouth that was open in the middle of the, of the, of the desert, didn't Moshe Rabbeinu know about it since he got the Torah? Moshe Rabbeinu got the Torah. In the Torah, it says that their mouth opens and swallows Korach. Why? He got the written Torah and the oral Torah. The Chachamim specifically says this is the one Mishnah that's not only erased from the Sidurim, was also erased from Moshe Rabbeinu. Hashem didn't give him this Mishnah. Why? Not because of this mouth, but because this Mishnah also mentions that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to die. It says that his grave is never going to be found. So reminding him that he's going to die one day may depress him. So Hashem didn't want to depress him. He didn't show him this Mishnah. So now, what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this story of the Pia Aritz? We obviously we have a huge amount of history to, to know that we uh, to use amount of lessons to learn that Korach sold his soul out for money. But still. Question is, what else? What else is there? And also your question about free choice. How does free choice work? So first, like we explained in the beginning, the actual mouth of the earth, the technology in essence, was invented during the six days. But it didn't go into effect until now. The question is, why did it go into effect now? Okay, it had a purpose, but still, there's plenty of reshaim before it didn't go into. Nimrod Rasha, Esav Rasha, Ishmael Rasha, there's plenty of reshaim before. Why now? Mouth of the earth, it says. There's plenty, I'm sure plenty of other reshaim. There's a, the Egyptians weren't exactly tzaddikim. There's a plenty of other Rashaim in history. Why now? There's a specific reason of why now. They said at the end of the day it will be easier to sin and also be easier to learn Torah. That's one thing. That's what I was going to do. Given. Given. Okay, the answer is Rabotai is extraordinary. The answer that answers it is Mamash, if you understand it, Ashrecha. If you understand the answer I'm about to give you, Ashrecha. 
It's deep. It's deep answer. What is the one thing that Moshe Rabbeinu is known for? Humblest man that ever lived. What is the humblest of all creation? The one creation that Hashem created, other than Moshe Rabbeinu, that everyone steps on, spits on, kicks, n- throws the ground. The ground itself is the humblest of all creation. Everyone steps on it and doesn't speak. Everyone spits on it and it doesn't complain. It just sits there and fulfills Hashem's will. But in this particular case, the angel of the ground was seeing the humblest of all men is being embarrassed and he's not doing anything about it. I can't take it. I'm going to kill him. The ground took vengeance in the name of Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, I'm the humblest of all creation. He's humbler than me. I can't take it. I'm going to kill Bukorach. I'm going to kill Korach. That's how humble Moshe Rabbeinu was. That's how humble Moshe Rabbeinu was the whole night. He's crying to Hashem, Hashem, please help me. Don't answer his prayers. Hashem, you know I'm trying. You know I'm trying. Why are you trying? He picked you. Why are you complaining? Why are you, star- Why are you scared? You're Moshe Rabbeinu. If I was Moshe Rabbeinu, I'd go to sleep comfortable. That's why I'm not Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is crying to Hashem, Hashem, don't answer his prayers, please help me, Hashem. Why are you worried? He says, maybe Korach has a schut I don't have. That's how humble Moshe Rabbeinu was. He thought maybe Korach is right. Maybe he has a schut. Maybe something. Who knows? I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. What do I know, he says. I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm only Moshe Rabbeinu. What do I know? The ground, the ground, the humblest of all creation said, I can't take it. I can't take it. I'm opening up, I'm going to eat him. That's how humble Moshe Rabbeinu was. Moshe Rabbeinu was so humble, we don't even have a magnitude of understanding of how humble he was. That's how humble he was. So, this is the perfect human being. So the first thing that we learn is humility. When Moshe Rabbeinu said to Am Yisrael when they complained about food, what are we that you're complaining to us? He literally meant it. What are we? We're nothing. He literally meant we're nothing. Not that he had self-conscious issues and he was a little knock-knock in the corner thinking, you know, getting everybody throwing rocks at him. No! He was a brave warrior. He killed Og Melech Abashan. He knew where he stood. But he knew everything is from Hashem. That's the difference, Rabbi Humility doesn't mean no confidence. Humility doesn't mean no ambition. Humility doesn't mean a loser. It means the exact opposite of all of them. It means you have ambition. It means you have confidence. It means you're a winner. But you know everything is from Hashem. Everything is from Hashem. Even when someone curses you, you know it's from Hashem. What made the Vida Melech the fourth to the Merkava? The fourth to the chariot of Hashem? What? What to the Shekhinah? Carrying the Shekhinah, we have Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David the Melech. A little bit of separation here. Why did Hashem pick? What? Because he wrote Tehilim? No. No. Not because he wrote Tehilim. Because he was Tzaddik? There's many Tzaddikim. Because he learned Torah? Many learned Torah. Because he's uh, the uh, father of the Mashiach? No. Shlomo is also father of Mashiach. Why? Why did he pick? Why did he pick David Melech? Why? Why did he pick David Melech to beat number four? When David Melech became king, one of the heads of the Sanhedrin, who was wicked, looked at David, and he's a king. He has army. He looks at, at, at David, and he gives him a klalanim retzet. What's a klalanim retzet? Every single curse in the book. You're a mamzer, you're a rasha, you're a goy, you're an idol worshiper, you're this, you're the word. Every single curse in the book. Wala klala, wala klala we have. What a curse he gave him. Now, David is a king. It's not a nach nach. He's a king. His army commander comes to him and says, Yana, your highness. What are we doing with this guy? 
Let me take my little sword, chop his head off, and that's it, we can move on. What are you hearing this for? David Melech Rabotai says to him, Chas v'shalom! Don't touch him. It's not him that's cursing me. It's God that's cursing me. No such thing happens to you without Hashem signing off. It's not your wife that's cursing you. It's Hashem. It's not your boss that's cursing you. It's Hashem. Everything is from Hashem. When the Vida Melech, in front of everyone, showed what he really believed, Hashem said, this perfect peace I was looking for. That's the perfect peace I was looking for. Number four. Perfect. You understand the purpose of life. Moshe Rabbeinu understood the purpose of life. He understood that everything is from Hashem. The question is, when are we? The question is, when are we going to understand that everything is from Hashem? The problems, the highs, the lows, the difficulties, the trials, the tribulations, the money, the losses, the wins, the gains. When are we going to start realizing it's from Hashem? We talked about it several times and I told everyone. The Gemara says in Masechet Shabbat, when someone goes up to Shemaim, they ask him several questions. One of the first questions they ask him is, did you conduct your business with Emunah? What does it mean, did you conduct your business with Emunah? Not only did you conduct your business honestly, obviously, you have to conduct your business honestly, but did you conduct your business with such a way that Hashem was a very permanent part of your business. You knew that all of your customers came from Hashem. All of your profits came from Hashem. All of your losses came from Hashem. And therefore, Hashem is a permanent partner. When there is gains, maser is a given. It's not, you don't have to think about it twice. It's not like, oh, should I give it? But maybe next month I'm not going to get it. Or this customer just signed off. And there's no calculation. It's an automatic function. Money comes in, maser comes out. And if you really have emunah, chamushit. You put 20%. But the obligation is 10%. If you do not have emunah to give 10% of the gross income to Torah, you, my friend, have no emunah. Question number one, failed. Failed. Why? Where's your partner? Hashem gave you 100% you wanted 10 in return. This Rabotai Karim is understanding how important Emunah is. Emunah is not just, oh, I believe that Hashem is going to help me when I'm down in the dirt. It's easy to have Emunah when you're in the dirt. Why? You have no other choice. No one else wants to deal with you. No one wants to give you a job. No one wants to talk to you. Everyone's throwing rocks at you. Let me skin. All you have is Hashem. It's easy to have, to have Hashem, of course. What else are you going to have? Even a dog doesn't want to look at you. The hard part is having emunah when you're succeeding. The hard part is remembering that you need to have emunah when you're in the fire. Difficulty, difficulty, difficulty. That's when you have to have emunah. When it's dark, you see the light. You see Hashem Barach when it's really dark. That's emunah. Emunah is not just something that we say in lectures. You have to live it. Which means that in order for you to get emunah, you must go through trials and tribulations. The only way to get emunah is not from shurim, it's not from books either. This will give you a little fire. The book will give you a little fire. But emunah is gained through experience. Overcoming your obstacles. Someone got sick and you believe Hashem is going to heal it, or you believe that Hashem has a reason for why He's doing it, you still praise Hashem's name despite the fact it doesn't make any sense and everyone calls you crazy, that's emunah. You have no money in the bank, but you're still going to shop for Shabbat, that's emunah. You're not looking at the prices of the, of the little milkshakes and this shake and that shake because it's Shabbat, that's emunah. You give maaser from the gross even though you know that technically based on math, the amount of money that you get in and the amount of money that you spend, you're not going to have enough money if you give the maaser. That means you're going to have a deficit, you're going to have a negative balance. That's emunah. You still give maaser. Why? 
Emuna is against all logic. If your emuna has logic, it's not emuna, it's common sense. You're just calling it emuna. It's the same thing we say, oh look, I saw the uh, Chabad make all these sins. It's not Chabad making sins. It's not Breslev making sins. It's fakers that dress like them. It's fakers that dress like them. Oh, I saw a Hasid. Oh, I saw Orthodox Jew. Oh, I saw that. You, you saw someone wearing a costume. That's all you saw. That's all you saw. You didn't see anything. Because if you read about what real Hasidut is about, it's above and beyond the law. Real Hasidut, if you read about it, it's above and beyond the law. You read about somebody like the Rogachov Rebbe? This person didn't think like we think. He thought based on how does everything in the world, time, matter, and everything in between connect to Allah, to the law. He would write a letter, they would ask him a question. He would write a letter. 75% of the letter would be explaining how special today is in the history of the Torah and all of the laws that pertain to today. And then one sentence, the answer to the question. Meaning, the fact that I'm writing today is not necessarily just because I want to answer your question, but because today is a very special day. Interestingly enough, we know a lot of Torah, every day is special. That's a Chabadnik, a real Chabadnik that knew Torah. He didn't just study one book or uh, one letter. So when you see people making stupid things, it has nothing to do with them. It has nothing to do with any Hasidu. It has nothing to do with Judaism. Real emunah, Rabotai Karim, is against all logic. It's when everything is dark. It's through the times where you think you're alone. Real emunah is the reminder God is there and He's the one pressing the button. Not that He's just there and He's going to save you. He put you there. Like David Melech says, it's not Him that's cursing me, it's God. If I didn't deserve to hear the curse, he wouldn't curse. Hashem says, you understand it? I'm going to make you the fourth piece. That's the goal of life. That's the goal of life. Understand that we have to know Hashem Itbarach is running the show. Yes. I'll buy all of them, so we'll just give 10. Allah is to give 10, yes. But if you have serious emuna, you should give 20. If you're rich, you should give 100% because you don't need all of it. If you're rich, rich doesn't mean a million dollars. Rich means a lot more than a million dollars. Meaning, the people in the world that have an enormous amount of money, let's say, for example, there was a, um, one guy that came to the um, uh, Rav Steinemann. And he says, Kvod Rav, you know, you should know, I give parnasa to a thousand avrichim. A thousand avrichim, I pay them every month. Psh, wow! Tzaddik! But you should know, Kvod Arab, I mean, it's, uh, it's almost half my money. It's a lot. It's hard. I need a bracha. So what would you think the Rav Steinemann would answer, answer him? Wow, what a tzaddik, a shrecha, may Hashem give you parnasah tova, chayim arukim. Hey, hey, what do you think? Somebody is giving parnasah to a thousand avrichim, businessmen? Minimum. Chazak baruch. May Hashem give you ten times more, so you have a thousand avrichim. What does he say? Rav Steinemann was a ish tzedek, ish emet, so never tzah. What did he say to him? I never knew that one person needed the salary of a thousand avrechim. He just said, I'm taking, it's half my money, it's going to a thousand avrechim, meaning a thousand avrechim are getting 50%, he's getting the other 50%. Why does one person need as much as a thousand? That's the emit. And anyone that tells you different is a liar. That's the emit. That is the emit. The emit is, why do you need as much as a thousand people? Why? Why do you need such a big house? You only have you only live in a way in a bed. Why do you need such a big house? Because it's your desires, it's your this, it's your okay, fine. But realize the more you are connected to material, 
the less room you leave for God. A lot of people say, yeah, listen, I go to these lectures and the guy motivates me to make more money and then I give staka and he, we talk about different motivations for the business. I could do the same thing. I was in business for 20 years. But I don't. Why? Because I know it's going to distance you from God. Maybe you'll make more money. I can give you lectures probably better than anybody else in the world. I did it. I didn't make money off of selling books. You know, the self-help guys, they make money off of selling books. They don't make money off of what they actually say. They make money off of selling books. I did it. But I don't tell you. I don't tell you about business. Why? It's going to distance you from God. The more, mater- the more you connect to material, the less room you have for God. That's why Yitro said, you must have people that have Yirat Shamayim, that are successful, that are Shemet, that hate money. Why they hate money? Because if they hate money, there's room for God. If they love money, they'll never have enough money. If they love money, they'll never be connected to God, really. They'll only be connected to God whenever there's money, whenever the economy is good, whenever the market's going up, whenever the real estate's going higher, whenever there's sales going through the door, whenever uh, Google is putting them rank number one, whenever all these things are working, that's when they love God. As soon as money leaves, where was God during the Holocaust? All of a sudden, they have questions. All of a sudden, they have all, I've always had these questions. Where was God during this? And where was God? Why don't you ask him when you ha- what happened? Why don't you ask him yesterday before Bitcoin went to nothing? Why don't you ask him yesterday before the market collapsed? Why didn't you ask him back then when everything was good? Why did you have all these questions never answered? I was busy. You're busy with the purpose of life? You didn't have time for the purpose of life? That's how we know. That their God is the God of money. So this Rabbotei Yekarim is the lesson that we learn from the Pia Aretz. Humility is extraordinary. And last but not least, a person needs to understand that when there is a, when there is a um, tzaddik, you have to fight for him. Just like the ground fought for Moshe Rabbeinu. A lot of people like to talk bad about certain people without really knowing the truth, without really knowing what really happened. Very easily do we throw people under the... Uh, I got you. I'll get your names. Very easily do people jump on the bandwagon when they see somebody down. Oh, look, they arrested him. He must be a cheater. He must be a liar. He must be this. He must be that. Did you ever hear him being a liar? No, but I'm sure they're right. Did you ever see him? Did you ever know? Do you know for sure what happened? Like there's a story right now, Hashem Menachem, what's happening. One of the biggest people in the world has been tortured for the last several years. And now there's a video of him touching a woman in the face, like giving her a tap on the face. And we're saying, oh, see, he's a rasha, he's a this, he does that. And this is like going through the internet like a virus. All of a sudden, all the tzaddikim, the rashaim, united. Why? They all say, oh, he's a rasha, he's a rasha, he's a rasha, he's a rasha. Did anybody ask? Maybe it's his daughter. Maybe it's his niece. Maybe it's his granddaughter. Maybe he's related to her. No, no one asks those questions. Why? Oh, he's touching a woman. He's a rabbi. How is he touching us? How do you know the story? Do you know the details? Maybe he's not all there. Maybe he lost his mind with all the suffering that he's gone through in the last few years. Why just immediately, like, for that, we spread it to all the internet. But I give you a Kiro video? No, no, I don't think they're going to like it. To get people to do tshuva? No, no, I don't think they're going to like it. I'm not going to send it to anyone. You're, you're talk too tough. But to send them Lashon HaRa, no problem. Lashon HaRa, yeah, it's a mitzvah. Mitzvah to embarrass a tzaddik. Mitzvah. Immediately we jump on a bandwagon to step on somebody. Immediately. The 250 rabbis had no second doubt on stepping against Moshe Rabbeinu. The same Moshe Rabbeinu that took him out of Egypt. Why? A little bit of cash. A little bit of cash we sold God. A little bit of cash we sold the leaders. A little bit of cash. A little bit of kavod. No, if he's the leader now, then I'm going to be the leader, and I'm going to be this, and everybody starts imagining what they're going to do. So, zealousness, 
zealousness is not only zealousness for God, zealousness is also zealousness for important people, people that have sacrificed their life for Hashem. And if you don't know the story, shut up! If you don't know what really happened, shut up! That's it, that's, that's the tachlis. That's the bottom line. Whether it's Rabbi Pinto, or Berlin, or the Rebbe, or this... Alvai, you reach the, the toenail of Torah that they actually have in their life. I don't know who's right, I don't know who's wrong, I don't care. I just know what the truth is. All I know is there's a Torah, anyone that violates it already gets enough punishment from God. I don't have to help him. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Even if things you see in your own eyes could be an illusion. Even things you see with your own eyes could be an illusion. I saw people that acted like tzaddikim with my own eyes. Yeah, the rabbi, the rabbi, the rabbi, the rabbi is good, he's good, he's good. And I saw with my own eyes these very same people, blackmail people against the rabbi. Not the rabbi from Chabad, a different one. People will do anything for money. No different than the story that I told you guys earlier today. There's a restaurant that calls themselves kosher and Orthodox Union sends a press release. Mayday, Mayday. They have several restaurants, each each worth millions. It's not a tiny little uh, kiosk selling shawarma. It's a big restaurant and they have a few places and they have a certification saying that they're, they're kosher. They're not even kosher. How can you sell food that's not kosher as kosher? How do you dare do such a thing? Don't you know that people's eternity depends on it? Don't you know that they hold something strict? It, it, it belongs to them? You're taking away something that's important to them, that's precious to them. You may not care about kosher, but they do. Is money that important that you don't care? You don't see? You don't hear? Nothing? Nothing? No one else matters except you and your pocket? This is the truth of this generation. We're selling out ourselves every day for money. Every day for money. So instead of going to to classes to learn about how to make more money, why don't we actually learn how to make ourselves closer to Hashem?